Uh, good morning everyone um, and welcome to the sixth meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in the Scottish Parliament's fifth session. I would ask everyone in the room to switch off mobile phones as they can interfere with the sound system. Uh, we have apologies this morning from our convener Neil Finlay, um, which is the reason that I am chairing today. Uh, the first item on our agenda today is an evidence session on GP recruitment. And we welcome to the committee uh, Jerry Laurie, the Deputy Director of Workforce, NHS Grampian, Leslie McClay, Chief Executive of NHS Tayside, Dr Miles Mack, Chair of the Scottish Council, the Royal College of General Practitioners, and Dr Alan McDevitt, Chair of the Scottish GP Committee, British Medical Association. Uh, we're not expecting any opening statements, so I'll move directly to questions. Um, and if I can uh, just uh, kick off, uh, we hear um, a lot from, from yourselves about uh, a GP crisis. So can I ask what constitutes the current position as a crisis? To start with that, um, we've seen, um, my college has been um, campaigning on this issue since 2013, when we've really predicted um, increasing problems for general practice. Um, we predicted that we would see GP numbers falling and, and a real problem actually delivering the sort of GP service that we want to do. Unfortunately, that seems to be happening. Um, we've got a third of practices here in Lothian um, who are unable to take new patients. We're seeing increasing number of practices being taken over by health boards, um, often with devastating results for, for patients. Um, and we're seeing increasing difficulty in recruiting GPs into the profession and, and um, holding them into the profession to uh, the longer t term in, the, in their career. So th this is what we believe is, is important, and this is, seems to be um, completely at odds with the Scottish Government's um, ambitions for 2020 vision and now for realistic medicine. Um, we are uh, uh, the, the physicians in the community. We are the ones that deal with um, elderly people with increasingly complex problems um, and to enable them to be looked after and cared for at home. Um, and also we take a great pride in providing the sort of work that we believe is crucial about having really good long-term relationships with our patients, really meaningful conversations with them um, to ensure that the care that they're getting is meeting really what matters to them and providing that continuity and first point of contact. So it's, it's on that basis that we believe that it's crucial to be looking at this issue um, and to ensure that we're making the right steps um, and particularly tackling the uh, falling percentage of funding that's going to general practice of the NHS fund. fund. It was set at 9.8% in 2005-06 and the last figures we've got, it's down to 7.4%. Um, and this despite the previous Cabinet Secretary's um, ambition um, to ask health boards to spend more money in, in primary care um, which was a commitment made, made to us uh, in November 2014. So we really are continuing to call for investment in general practice, and we've got clear evidence that we need that investment. And I'll draw to the, the committee's attention to the work by Helen Irvin, um, who independently of the college um, has made it quite clear that investment in primary care will reduce inequalities, um, will provide services for patients at home, and actually reduce uh, requirement for A&E um, and elective healthcare services. If I <coughs> contribute, I mean, uh, the BME has been doing a, a GP um, practice survey every quarter now for some time, and our latest figures from September show 28.6% vacancy rate in general practices around Scotland, which is the same as it was in June. We see a substantial change in the number of posts that are still vacant after six months from 42 last year to 80 this year. Um, so we're getting clear evidence now of a major recruitment problem. In addition to that, practices can't obtain locums when they have to go on holiday or for covering sickness or maternity. <clears throat> so we've got very clear evidence now of a recruitment problem into general practice, um, as well as, as Miles has said, the, the fact that many practices, because of that, are having to somewhat restrict the services they provide. So in terms of determining what the problems are, we're now seeing them very real, and they're actually beginning, I think, to affect patients. Uh, and I think that's when it becomes a crisis, when patient care begins to be affected by the numbers of GPs we had. And I think the key thing here today is to talk about, although I often talk about the role of other professionals in helping general practice going forward. It is also about making sure that general practice medicine is available to our patients. 
that in future patients can access a GP as a doctor when they need to. And I think today is as much about that as it is about the total redesign that we're talking about in terms of primary care. But I think the key thing is the, the crisis, the shortage of GPs is now manifest and we're working very hard to change the fundamental nature of general practice to make it attractive both for doctors to stay in and also to come into as a future career. And that's one of the fundamental reasons why the BMA is now renegotiating the contract with the government to try and resolve some of the underlying problems that make have made general practice a less attractive career to stay in and to come into initially as a young, a young member of the medical profession. Yeah, um, I think we're all very aware of the workforce pressures, both um, demographic and in terms of recruiting new GPs that the uh, profession is under. Um, and particularly the, the amount of vacancies that are, are going unfilled is, seems to be the signal problem that we're facing. Um, I just wondered, did the panel think that the use of the term crisis contributes to this solution? Because what I've found in my conversations is that when this term is used again and again, there's a perception building up and it can be quite off-putting. It was interesting what uh, Dr McDevitt was saying, your language was more temperate to begin with, speaking of a recruitment problem. I wonder if you can unpack some of the challenges uh, beyond just the contract renegotiation towards uh, GP recruitment. And perhaps if you think we can reframe the language that we use, because I don't know if I can appreciate where you're coming from and, you know, uh, defining it as a crisis, but I don't know if that actually contributes. I'm pretty keen to hear your thoughts. I mean, as we've been around the country preparing for changing the contract, we've talked about changing the mood music, because the first thing we have to do is to change the perception of general practice into being an attractive uh, career for young doctors. And unfortunately, the, the negative circumstance that we find ourselves tends to make people say, well, I better not to go and do that. So it's vital to change the mood music. And I think it, we can look forward to a very positive future for being a GP in Scotland if we can manage to achieve all the things we aim to, particularly through contract realignment, but also about changing the role of the GP um, into being an expert medical generalist in the community um, who's part of a multi-professional team who can focus on what we call undifferentiated presentations. In other words, if you think you need to see a doctor and you think you might be sick, that's basically what that does. Complex care, dealing with people with more than one condition, and also being a, a clinical leader who's responsible for improving the actual outcomes for patients the things that patients want to happen in their lives in relation to their health and us working together with them to make it better. I think general practice is a fantastic career and I think we have to make sure that the role and circumstance to being a GP in Scotland are as positive as we can be. And I think that's how you change the mood music. And in response, just the word crisis isn't helpful. And I think when does it become a crisis? It's been a building issue and it will remain an issue for some time to come, even when we're fixing things. So I'm not hugely fond of the word crisis, but I'm responding to the way people are describing it. There certainly is a major problem. Uh, you can call it what you like. That problem will take some time to turn around and we'll all have to work very hard together to fix that. Thank you, convener. Can I say for what it's worth that I, I believe that we are in an absolute crisis in terms of GP recruitment, and I'm absolutely comfortable with that language, um, not least because um, in, in my constituency, we've not had no new, new medical centres built in 45 years, despite year-on-year -year pro proliferation of new housing um, and some surgeries which have had to close their lists. Um, I am very supportive of the um, RCGP's call for an increased investment up to 11% of uh, the health budget, but I want to explore in particular from the panel um, into the trainee issue. And we've heard and we know that not all the trainee vacancies that have been made available have been filled. But what I heard, what we heard this committee last week, more alarmingly, arguably, was that of those trainees, that not all of those trainees are domiciled in Scotland and may not actually then go on to practice in Scotland. I wonder if the panel can bottom that out and just give us an, an idea of the extent of that issue. Yeah. So, so I, think it's, uh, I think it's an interesting position because the trainees that are coming through now are not the trainees that came through when I started in the NHS. Their expectations are very different. Their career aspirations are very different as well. Um, and uh, for example, we have a more predominant and ramping more predominantly female workforce, who are some who are choosing to work part time. But actually, we have some evidence that male workforce are also choosing to work part time as well. Um, the, I guess something that Alan said about how uh, GPs are marketed and sold, the, the image of a GP I don't think is particularly positive. 
if we think about what the, how it's portrayed in, in, in the media and the television, particularly around sort of soaps, and uh, I think it's a very negative image, and we don't create an attractive um, uh, opportunity for people to choose to become a GP um, currently. Can I come into that too? Um, I'd just like to just bring to your attention the Think GP campaign that the college has just started on. Um, we are absolutely keen to um, ensure that general practice is portrayed in the way it should be seen. Um, we've got four videos of um, GPs across the country, across the UK, young doctors who are working at fantastic levels and just showing the variety, the challenge, um, the responsibility that these young doctors are performing. It's un completely unclear, uh, completely clear to me that it, it's a fantastic job. It should be a fantastic job. We should be sh um, batting people off to get into general practice, just as we needed to do when Anna and I started our careers, when there were mar far more um, applications for every post, and we were able to select, we were able to um, get the very best medical graduates into that. Um, I, I, I take your point about crisis and the talking that down. Um, I do regret that we've had to talk about general practice in those negative terms, but I do believe that we have to tell the truth um, because these doctors are training in general practice, and if they hear from my college that everything all is roses and that they can that there's enough money, there's enough the, the future is sound, um, but yet they're seeing with their own eyes doctors who are working 10, 12 hour days who are feeling that actually they're ability to work and their ability to provide safe patient care is being compromised by the level of the workforce. Um, it, it gives me no credibility, it gives the college no credibility, and gives none of the solutions that we've come up with the credibility that we have. And I would like to point out just how much positive work the college has been doing on this issue. We were ahead of the game with remote and rural recruitment back in 2012, and we started to explore some of the ideas that we've now brought forward is the GP career flow, which is the idea that if we are, to, we can't just think about those 100 new places. We have to look downstream of that, um, actually what is the career going to be like in the future, how do we retain people, but also look upstream. Um, I've just written a blog for the GMC um, describing some of the issues about bad-mouthing general practice in psychiatry as, um, in the medical schools. This should just not be happening. It does seem to be happening, and this is the sort of thing that we really need to start to challenge because it's, it's not fair on the profession and it's severely damaging. And we need, do need to look right the way through um, to making sure that we're training in the right way. Um, I'm delighted to say that this week, um, or yesterday, I had a fourth-year medical student sitting in with me who's spending 10 months of his fourth year in my practice, learning general practice. Two of the patients I saw as duty doctor yesterday, I admitted, he has now has the opportunity to join the post-receiving ward round at Regmore Hospital tomorrow to see what happens to them in the, in the ward and follow them back into the community. Actually, if we're looking to see that sort of joined up um, approach to medicine, this is the way to train doctors and this is the sort of support that we need. And I'm, I'm, this is a, a pilot run by Dundee, but it's just this sort of thing that we're talking about in our GP career flow. So I really apologize if it's been seen that I have seemed to be very negative, but obviously one part of my role is to say, tell the truth and to make sure that a consistent approach across the patch does actually provide the resources for the sort of initiatives that we've been putting forward in the blueprint uh, document we provided last June and the manifesto in, in October. Okay, so thank you very much. <clears throat> so um, I, as a, a board chief executive, I think the first thing that I would say is I fully acknowledge the challenges that are there uh, in relation to general practice and the whole recruitment issue that we have, but we have a number of workforce challenges. Um, and um, as a board, and I think as a, a kind of um, system, a kind of whole health care, health and social care system, there are a number of strategic plans that we have in place um, that we're implementing locally. And if I just describe our situation in NHS Tayside, so um, as a board, we serve a population of about 400,000. Um, we have in somewhere in the region about 330 general practitioners. Our vacancy level is, is pretty constant and will probably sit at somewhere in the region of about 5%. Um, we are fully aware of the age profile. That is something that is challenging the health and social care system across a number of specialties. Um, and I certainly know just now we have somewhere in the region about 15% of our GP workforce um, is sitting at the over 55. 
So there is clearly a challenge there. Um, I think there are a number of things that um, we are doing um, locally. Um, if I give an example, as a board, we have a five-year primary care strategic framework that has been put together um, through and by our clinical leaders, but actually looking at the whole healthcare system. Um, we have taken on board the opportunity through the formation of clusters, and that's allowing a kind of clinical leadership model to form locally. And so in NHST side, we have 13 clusters that are actually, there's a level of maturity now establishing, where there's engagement across general practice, looking at their data, looking at information, and actually supporting um, in, in terms of some of the challenges they have. And there's a lot of work that um, we're doing around the extended role of the multidisciplinary team. So I think I'm very clear that general practice are the clinical leaders and they sit at the heart in terms of primary and community services, in terms of our delivery and our vision um, over the next five years of what we're doing. But I think um, to the panel, I would certainly highlight the role and importance of the wider multidisciplinary and agency team as well, and the contribution that they can make in supporting um, meeting the demands and the healthcare needs um, of the population we're serving. Okay. Colin, you wanted to come in at this point? Oh, excuse me. Th thanks very much, um, convener. Earlier answer, Dr. Matt, you, you indicated that, that the current crisis was, was predicted. So what do you think frankly, didn't happen to, to heed those, those predictions and, and what lessons do you think we can learn now in terms of trying to resolve the, the, the current crisis? Um, at the core of our campaign strategy was to see an increased percentage funding going to general practice and that was what we brought to the previous Cabinet Secretary um, and that was clearly what we, what was, we believe we'd made that um, argument quite strongly. Um, that is the single most important thing that we need to do um, to give the resources to general practice to provide the, the staffing, um, both in general practice staffing, but in other members of staff too. As Alan suggests, um, it, we now need to think in a, a wider um, multidisciplinary team to deliver this care. And there probably are not going to be enough GPs immediately, but we do have to have the aspiration to increase the number of GP numbers. It's absolutely clear. Um, we've seen as over the same period um, the Scottish Government's own press release said 40% increase in consultant numbers. Um, that seems to be um, matched by almost no increased number in GPs, and the, I, uh, the workforce survey actually suggests we lost 2% last in the last two years. So it does seem that actually the workforce planning has gone awry, um, that we're not actually investing in the workforce in the place where we should have it. Um, to, to, at a time when we're talking about 2020 vision, we're talking about more community care, to increase the consultant numbers by 40% with no concurrent number of increasing general practitioners and additional members of staff seems to be wrong. I mean, I think when I came into general practice, we really had only our reception staff. And now we have a bit more and that I have about six GPs in the practice for 10,000 patients. I've got one whole time equivalent practice nurse and half a healthcare assistant. And that's the only staff <clears throat> I have to deal with the acute demand as it comes <clears throat> into the practice. Now, we have a wilder dis multidisciplinary team, but there's been a lack of investment into the structure that supports general practice <clears throat> at the same time as the actual work that we do has become much more complex. The ways we drive up quality, that has created increased demands, particularly on GP time. And so that lack of investment into the broader needs of patient as they present to general practice, which of course is where 90% of patient contact occurs, the place where you and your family mainly come in contact with medicine is general practice, but we haven't substantially invested in general practice and supporting how that medicine delivers the best outcomes for patients. And that strain is telling now on the enormous workload on GPs. And we've no one else really to share that with. Now, we need to find new workforce and it is going to be partly GPs, but we know how slow that will be to come on stream. So it's going to be a lot of other professions coming in to join us and meeting that immediate patient need and demand on the front line and for the right professional to deal with those patient needs in a way which we've not had the capacity to do before before. An example perhaps of how strange it became was that if a patient needed a blood test, other say they were at home, we were told that that couldn't be done by a district nurse because it was a GP contract blood. Now, it was a need the patient had, but because of the way people thought about how we worked in the contract, it prevented teams working to meet patient needs appropriately. We need to get rid of all that and start working properly as professional teams, have the right professional meeting the right patient need, and a much greater number of professionals available to share 
the workload that currently is mainly dealt with in general practice, because that is where the bulk of the work occurs right now. <clears throat> so that investment, and I suppose we call on the Parliament and the government now to have to invest in that, and it's an absolute requirement for investment. I know how hard the public purse is stretched, but this is an absolute requirement. If you want to fix this, if you want to have general practice for your families and mine, this requires investment now in this new model of general practice. We are absolutely open for that kind of general practice, for the other professions to come in and play their part, to have a greater offering to the public when they approach general practice, which is the hub. General practice is the hub just now where most people come in contact with the NHS. We want to build up that hub so that there are greater offering of professionals immediately available to the public to meet their needs at the front line. And we're up for making that the right way forward. But the parliament and the government have to now make that investment, even though times are hard. Thank you very much. Uh, I listen intently, uh, Dr McDevitt, in regards to the point you're making. But I must agree we've got to look at it. Actually, I'll, I'll bring a word which has been used for a long time, demarcation. Let's reduce the demarcation and let's work together to solve the problem. But one of the problems, I think, it's not just money. You know, and I agree that that should be looked at, but it's, you know, it's a start. We need to start now to get more, more people in to be a doctor. Now, I have to say I'm working on a particular case for a constituent just now where the boy wants to be a doctor, but unfortunately is a few points short to get into university. And I've actually went to see the university, and I hope they're listening to me today. Uh, at the, you know, should we, we have to now train doctors in, in you know, what is it, five, seven years? Uh, basically. It's five years at university and then subsequently. Uh, yeah. So basically we have to start now to, to train the doctors that we need, you know, and, and to, to, to resolve this. And look at, with the greatest respect, each and every situation we've got throughout the country. We've got doctors who are working in their own owned surgeries. We've got doctors who are working in health centres. We've got doctors who are getting paid by the NHS. Doctors who are basically managing their own practice. You know, I think they should be doctoring rather than managing, uh, if I can use that word. So, you know, I think we have to look at the whole situation and resolve it. And we've got to look at money, yes, but we've also got to look at workforce and how, how, um, how we can encourage. And if anyone out there can help me to get this boy into this university, because he wants to be a doctor and his family is going through a terrible time just now because he, he can't get in there because of this few points. So do you think universities should look at this and do you also believe that we should look at demarcation within the, the, the gambit that you just spoke about? If I, if I may, yes. I mean, at the universities, I think governments are quite rightly looking to make sure that the recruitment into medicine represents the population. And we do know that if people come from their populations, they're more likely to serve those populations, whether it be rural or deprived. So absolutely universities should do that and government should be involved in doing that. It will always be hard to get into medicine because of the competitive nature. Far more people still, although the numbers have dropped, want to become doctors than can become doctors. Um, and we have to, that's always going to be hard. But I think we have to make sure there's equity of access from across the social spectrum into universities. And I think a lot more work has to be done because it's clearly not having a major impact at the moment. Actually, more people out there who want to be doctors but can't be doctors. Yes, yes, yes. There are. There have been consistently that for a long time. Yep. We're still consistently seeing that the numbers applying to medical school are very high. What's really sad is that they're dropping off um, at later stages. Um, you're absolutely. Um, Alan's exactly right about where people come from. Um, we we understand that only 50% of entrants into medical school are now Scottish domiciled. So uh, our evidence internationally, and this is borne out from the work we did with remote and rural work earlier, is that it, the people tend to return to the place of uh, domicile after university. And I think it's something which does need to be looked at. The other thing is, I th think you're hinting at is the idea of contextualized admissions, which I heartily applaud, that actually there's very good evidence, and actually some of that's from the Scottish Government's own work about um, uh, removing access barriers to education um, of um, reducing grades for um, people from particular backgrounds who find it very difficult. This isn't just from inner city areas. This is actually a big issue for remote and rural areas where um, in some re uh, remote 
uh, secondary schools, they won't have the opportunity of doing all four sciences um, and by default may not have the grades that they're needed. They may also struggle to get the sort of experience um, of nursing homes and what like, and we've had a real issue with remote and rural recruitment because of that. So contextualising the admissions seems to be a, a clear way forward and something which um, seems to bait evidence and actually probably means to more likely to, to get the doctors we need. I'll just say one thing about demarcation. Um, I think there's a, a real risk that actually we need to do whatever we can in that, in that role, um, but actually we also need to be clear about what the primary care team is. Um, I'm very proud of some work that we did with the Royal College of Nursing, Royal College of Pharmacy, uh, the Royal Pharmaceutical Society and the other members of primary care to try and define what the primary care team is and actually what we can provide that. Because whereas we don't want there to be artificial barriers, what we are going to need is a network group of professionals who understand what their job is, understand what they can expect from others, and have got really good communication links. And some of that will about being defining what we do as doctors. And it probably is important that doctors are clear about what our job is uniquely and what it is um, nurses can do and, and first practitioners can do and pharmacists. Thank you for that. If I may just build on that point, I think there are some really good examples around the kind of workforce planning and development um, around the extended primary care team where, where the principle really is about, it's not about people substituting, but it's actually looking at the workload and the demand and actually um, allowing certain healthcare practitioners, and we use the kind of statement to say to work to the top end of their licence. And I think within the nursing profession in particular, and you know, particularly in primary care, where we now have a number of advanced nurse practitioners we have nurse consultants. Um, previously, a lot of the nurse consultants were working in quite specialist areas within secondary care. But now, in terms of medicine for the elderly, for example, we in one of our deep end practices in Dundee, we have a nurse consultant with that background is actually working out in primary care. I think there's also some really good examples, again, where, and this has been done collaboratively with the GP, so working with the clinical team, but looking at our allied health professionals, our physiotherapists, and them running particular clinics where actually they can be independent with an agreed scope um, of practice. Um, the, the last one, I, I think also, and I think it's something the panel touched on uh, last week, is around the role of the uh, pharmacist. Um, and certainly in NHST side, we've had pharmacists attached to GP practices for at least the last 10, 15 years, and that has supported the, it, it doesn't take away the challenges that are there, but it does help the demand and the workload and allows pharmacists to undertake work that actually the GPs don't need to do. So I think there's still lots more work to be done, but I think there are some really good examples developing and emerging in the primary community care service where there's that real strength. And, and if I may, panel, just, just to make reference to, you know, not just a healthcare professional, but we've got some great examples where third sector are, are in, inputting and supporting, even just transporting patients into the practice that actually can be transported but they don't have access to it to see if home visits etc have been done so absolutely core in terms of working on that multidisciplinary team but I think recognising the opportunity that health and social care integration is bringing and the relationships with third sector it's about actually looking right across um, the whole health and social care system to support the increasing demand of population that we have. How many training places do we have in Scotland for to to someone to become a doctor? Do we know? The current intake is 350. The, this year's intake was 350. That's GP training. training. Oh, sorry, big yeah. students. Uh, uh, students. students going into university to become a doctor. Do we know how many? I'm afraid I don't have this. I'm looking for another one, one but yeah. do we know how many? I, don't think, I certainly don't have those figures to hand. I mean, uh, Glasgow University, when I was there, was 200 a year, so uh, you can take it from there. That was one of the biggest medical schools. But can I just share with you, I, I have the same problems used helping some of my um, patients' children to get into medical school. I have exactly the same problem. And one of the things we recognised is that it's actually very difficult, as Miles said, for some students to get access to experience with a GP because they don't know doctors in the you know, so in fact, we're trying to arrange in our area to do a, a swapping arrangement with another practice so that we can facilitate local children getting some experience of general practice to try and help people from our communities uh, get into medicine just as much. So I think it's something that we share with you. I think I suspect we'll all have been involved at some point in trying to help um, children to get into medicine, but it's a difficult area and it probably always will be. Just ask if we can maybe keep our answers slightly shorter. Uh, Jerry. 
So in Grampian, we've been offering a scheme called Doctors at Work for school pupils who are academically on that route to becoming doctors. And we've opened it up for the whole of Grampian. We take some students from out with Grampian, um, including those from Orkney and Shetland, who would be in that position of not necessarily having that access. Um, it's running very, very successfully. Um, the, the pupils come for a week and spend time um, interacting with doctors, but also shadow doctors as well. So everybody gets a better access. One of the things that's really surfacing around that is about individuals' values in terms of what their uh, intention is. It's not just about your academic ability, it's about your values and what you believe in and, and, and your commitment, I guess, to becoming a doctor or a GP in the future. Can I sorry, just add one little thing from the back of the multidisciplinary team? in relation to physicians' associates, which I, I don't see mentioned earlier. In Grampian, with Aberdeen University, we are running a course. Uh, we're on our sixth cohort. We're actually offering these individuals bursaries. They come from a different supply. They are generally science graduates, and they do a, a, a postgraduate uh, degree and then become part of our workforce. We're highly successful in terms of placing them. In fact, we could place more. And in, in primary care, those who have them are very enthusiastic about them. And I think need, there needs to be more work and support around the physician's associates. Alison. And direct this first question to Miles Mack. Um, when you were speaking earlier, you spoke about the devastating results for patients when, now I might have misunderstood and I'll look back at the record, when practices were taken over by the NHS. And I'd just like to explore that mixed model a bit further, if I may. I mean, Jerry Laurie, you were speaking of the fact that part-time working is more attractive, both to men and women, which is obviously going to have an impact. But I'd just like to understand whether or not the government could be doing more in terms of offering salaried positions, or whether you have any concerns about that model. Number of issues to do with that. I think um, salary posts do seem to be more attractive, particularly when um, doctors are concerned about um, the, the general medical services contract not being fit for, particularly fit for purpose, um, and the level of workload that's there. Um, we do hear um, it, we don't have got clear evidence of this, but people do seem to want to be salaried to practices rather than health boards a lot of the time. Um, we do have concerns that some of the practices being taken over by health boards seem to cost an awful lot of money to run, um, sometimes twice as much. We're not sure if that's because um, of underestimate in the past or whether it's just because um, actually um, self-employed doctors are an incredibly efficient way of doing that. The multidisciplinary team is important, um, but obviously with your role of scrutiny, um, make sure you're aware of the uh, review by the University of York was published in June 2015, um, which just pointed out that actually there's not clear evidence that it reduces the overall um, need for GPs. Um, that it's, it's, that it's role substitution is being widely promoted, but the extent to which this will reduce GP workload is unclear. Um, and also, they also point out that other ways of working about triage and other things seems to be more about shifting work around rather than necessarily making life easier for GPs. So we do have to be clear what we're trying to achieve. Um, and the multidisciplinary working way of working is not a cheap option. Um, they're unable to see in anything like the rate that GPs can um, and also need supervision. Um, and also built into that is the time GPs will need um, to start to spend more time um, interacting with inter the interface with the other members of the team. Oh, sorry, I, I, I didn't see you. <laughs> Thank you, convener. Um, so what you're saying there is that the multidisciplinary team is, it, it's important that we look at this model. I mean, Elaine McNaughton, Dr McNaughton, when she was giving evidence last week, was saying actually it wasn't new to her. It may be in some other areas. But while we're looking at this, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that we need to ensure we have enough GPs because this is not a substitute for general practitioners. Um, can I just ask, the Scottish Government have told us that the number of GPs has increased by 7%. Now, um, I know th there are three of us certainly who represent Lothian here. We've been told that we have 39 restricted lists in Lothian and particularly deep end practices seem to be suffering, um, uh, you know, terribly from this. So are these extra 7% of GPs that we're hearing about, are they having any impact on health inequality? GP posts um, are headcount rather than whole time equivalent. 
Um, we've got clear evidence from the workforce survey, actually ISD perform, um, performed, that we've lost 2% in two years. Um, so it, it may be that the headcount is increasing, um, but whole time equivalent, actually the number of GPs that are on the ground to deliver care is not increasing, and actually the trend is downwards. Question, convener. Um, very quickly, um, Dr. McDivitt, in your letter, um, you certainly raised concerns about uh, a suggestion that more GPs might work between primary and acute care. Could you? This comes out of the one of the many variations of hubs that are around, um, in, in particularly in, in the Ford Valley area, where. And I think we have worked on this to try and get an agreed position on it, but the idea that the future of general practice is a doctor who works in secondary care and comes into primary care and dips in and out isn't one that we find attractive. We think we need doctors who work in primary care as general practitioners, expert medical generals in the community. Um, we shouldn't, we've got a very scarce workforce. The idea of sharing it in some intermediate role, as is indeed happening in the Fourth Valley, worries me at a time when we can't recruit to the core general practice job that we're getting new jobs that take people away from that area. And Fourth Valley was one of the first areas that had a major crisis in staffing practices. So, so we don't see that as a the future. There are things we can learn from the, the pilot that's going on there, but we certainly don't see that as the future for general practice in Scotland. Well, quite clearly, it's about having GPs in the community, expert medical journalists available to everyone in their community is a fundamental part of the future for general practice in Scotland, not some other invention of what general practice could be. Um, uh, thanks very much. I'm interested in developing that a little further because I was interested that um, Dr. Miles Mack spoke very animatedly about the opportunity for his medical student to work in... Um, a rural general practice and to follow the patient into the hospital, go in the ward round and follow them back into the community. And I actually, um, as a clinician myself, although I'm a pharmacist, not a, a medic, um, I found that, you know, the quality, what, what attracted me to my job was the quality of care that I was able to deliver and the, it, you know, the challenge, the clinical challenges. And I thought actually being able to move GPs for, from into more complex care might make the job more attractive. So I'd be interested to hear what. I'm smiling slightly because I reckon my job is pretty complex. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so, so we deal with, you know, we'll be dealing with people from, you know, new babies to the elderly, pregnancy, people with mental health problems, because you can't separate mental health from the physical illnesses that affect people. So GPs deal with all that every day. And in the one surgery, I'll go from all the spectrums of age, all the spectrum of disease, and I'll have to manage that all along. In addition to that, the fact that people have multimorbidity now, they don't just have one illness or one problem. They, they have heart disease, diabetes, they've had a stroke and they're depressed, you know, and they've had a recent bereavement. So that's one of the beauties of general practice, dealing with the whole person. <clears throat> and that, that, I think, is the, the element of complexity that I would say is what engages me. It's about real people <clears throat> with the real problems. But as well as that, we have an increasingly complex elderly population um, who we need to look after at home. If we continue to deal with people, older people with complex health problems by sending into hospital, we cannot build the hospitals fast enough. So we need to look after people close to home. There is no doubt about it. Everyone's in agreement. Now, taking on that complex medical workload is a real challenge, not least because there isn't time to do it just now, but as well as that, we will have to continue to build our skills. And we plan, as part of the GP contract going forward, to build in regular time that's non-patient facing for GPs to continue to upskill themselves in the role that they're taking on, which is going to be a much more complicated role, making sure that people are cared for at home the way they wish to be with complex medical problems. And the advances in medical technology will allow that to happen much more. That's a very complex part of work. Most GP training actually occurs in hospitals. We would like more of it to happen in general practice, and that's an issue we need to discuss. But we have plenty of experience of hospital medicine. What we need is general practice medicine in the communities. We need to make sure that's what we're trained in, and that's what we're experts in, and that's what we train young doctors to do. And I have no qualms about saying that's complicated enough to engage me for my whole career. Don't see the potential for GPs to be caring for people in community hospitals or in... Maybe saying they do that now, if, and that's about buildings again. Someone else mentioned we shouldn't get too tied up on buildings here. That this is about where the patients care. Actually, the, the sort of complex people in care community also are very similar to some of the ones we have at home. Increasingly, we'll find that the complexity of your problem won't be determined by your location. 
it's, it's your nature. And, and basically, we're getting much better at dealing with things at home, which in the past we'd have said would have happened in a hospital or in a community care hospital. But there are places where, there are many parts of the country where, for example, community hospitals are invaluable to the way that that geography works. Sometimes it's better to bring the patient to where the professionals are. Other times you want, in a, a big area, a, a conurbation to bring the professionals to where the patient is. And we need to be absolutely flexible about that. The actual placement of care should be irrelevant. It's the complexity and quality of we can, care we can provide. And the presumption of care should be in your own home. We have to start with that and go from there. And you should only go elsewhere when elsewhere is definitively going to improve your outcome. Can I just raise the flag for remote rural medicine where um, GPs are commonly looking after hospitals and doing amazing work. Um, they obviously need extra skills for that. Um, and David Hogg, who's actually in the Think GP video, is an example of that where on the Isle of Arran they are providing all the hospital care as well. Um, one of the big problems is actually the recruitment crisis has put community, as people, as community, the committee will be aware, put community hospitals at risk. Um, we've seen Lockhart Hospital closing because of practice unable to cover that as well as the GMS workload. Um, and that happened to my own practice. And it was a deep regret that we've had to stop providing the care to the Ross Memorial Hospital um, because we're just unable to recruit the GPs we need to do the day-to-day -day work safely. So you're quite right, we have got lots of skills. You're quite right, we are invaluable to the NHS. Um, at a time when the GPs are short, we do need to focus that where it's absolutely essential um, because no one else is qualified to do the work that we do as GPs. For the record, uh, there are 898 medical undergraduate places in uh, this year in August uh, 2016. I don't know if the panel want to comment on whether they feel that's enough to um, provide us with the, the GPs and, the, and the, the medical staff of the future. I would think it's probably more about retaining those into careers and making sure that their career flow is appropriate to where we want to go. So actually, if those... Uh, probably we can improve the tra the conversion rate into general practice for Scotland um, if we um, undertake some of the ideas that we're proposing in the GP career, fl career flow um, proposals. Alison asked most of the questions that I was going to ask. So um, I'm <laughs> sorry. It's just an observation, picking up on the points that Marie made uh, as well, um, and that the work, the, the, the potential for a GP to work both in general practice and in a acute services. It's just um, an observation where I visited a, a community hospital in the Highlands and Islands where I think there was a rural fellowship was operating and the anecdotal, and it's purely anecdotal evidence, was that it, one of the great attractions was the fact that this GP could work as a GP for two days a week and then was able to go into the local hospital and work there for three days a week, whatever, it, whatever the balance was. And it was a Clearly, it was it was it was what made that job particularly attractive because there was this mixed mixed working, and I just wonder if you had any observations on that. Me, I mean, we've always done that in general practice. I, I was a, a clinical assistant in respiratory medicine. I've done medical politics. I, I've done all sorts of other jobs as well as being a GP, and that's fantastic. And that's what we call a portfolio career. And we are all myself and Miles are portfolio career GPs. That's always been part of general practice, but that isn't what GMS and general practice is about. The core job, the two sessions he does as a GP, <clears throat> is what being a GP is. The rest is other things you can do, and there are lots of other things that GPs can do, whether it be working for the benefits agency, the government. So there's always going to be the capacity for GPs to have other roles. What we've often forgotten, though, is the need to make the core role as the GP attractive. That be the thing, that the reason why people come into general practice. If everyone who becomes a GP only spends half the time doing it, we're certainly going to need an awful lot more than we're already talking about. So we must make being a core GP a fundamentally attractive and interesting um, future career. Because otherwise, well, if saying it's okay because you can do other stuff just isn't a way to make it the future. So yes, it's interesting, it's good that being a GP does allow you flexibility in your career, allow you other interests, but it's still about being a GP that we need to make the biggest attraction to bring general practitioners into the profession. Thank 
Thank you. Thank you. So, um, just picking up on Marie's point and maybe just building on that one a little, I, I'd quite like to bring to the panel's attention just some of the work we're doing in Tayside, which we classify as enhanced community support, um, and we're putting that in as core service provision. And what that does is it builds on the GP practice population, but it brings in the medicine for the elderly consultant, the psychiatry of old age consultant. So these are individuals whose job plans take them both working in the secondary care sector and also in the primary care and and what what we do there is and we've got good evidence through the the pilots we initially did was so we were targeting unscheduled care so we know the challenges for older people and unscheduled admissions so it's that rapid assessment from that team that includes the gp dedicated gp time the poa consultant the medicine for the elderly the pharmacist the senior district nurse the social work the the ehp going into the home of that individual and it's an example of where the gp is working with other senior med medical colleagues undertaking that rapid assessment, often making the decision that person needs admitted, but managing their admission in and then managing their discharge back out. And we've had a lot of success, which we found that A, we've reduced the number of unscheduled care admissions, and, and secondly, when people have been admitted, their length of stay has been reduced. So that is something that after the piloting, we were putting that full rollout, and, it, and it's helping and supporting the GPs and working with that wider primary and secondary care colleagues to to manage that patient journey. Uh, thanks, uh, convener, and thanks for coming along. Th there was a couple areas I wanted to um, to touch on. The first was around about spend. Now, you talked about percentage spend, and you're keen to get that percentage spend up by two, two and a half points or whatever. Now, because you're talking percentages, clearly that means that somebody else is going to have a reduced spend. So I just wanted to kind of throw that out there and see what you wanted to, to say about that. And I suppose what I'm trying to get to with that um, uh, well, first we'll put that in the context. Uh, the Scottish Government's talking about a shift to primary care. So I'm assuming when you're talking about GP spend, the way you see the picture is, yeah, there's money going to primary care, but it's not going to GPs, it's going somewhere else in the, the primary care arena. Is that how you see it? And then I suppose what I'm trying to get to with that is around about the whole concept of preventative spend. Um, and do you have an argument um, that we've heard before from GPs and can you put some flesh on that, which is if you invest the money in the GPs, you're saving money in A&E &E, and how do you quantify that? So I can, that's the first kind of thing. And the second thing I wanted to go through was round about um, the, the, the GP workload um, concept. So we're talking about multidiscipline, we're talking about taking work away from GPs. And I know you have some reservations on some parts of that, but in general, the coughs come away. I've talked to pharmacists and they're very keen and very happy that repeat pharmacies and that kind of thing is coming away from GPs. So there are things that are reducing GPs workload. And again, has there been any analysis done around about the day in the life of a GP, how much of that you would say is stuff that GPs shouldn't be doing that can go elsewhere and how much road, uh, ground have we made going down that road? So two areas to talk about. Speak about percentage spend. I think um, I'm, I'm sure that Scottish Government is going to want to invest in the, in the health service and it's been consistently doing that. Um, I think what we really need to do is make sure we're investing in the right place. We were very disappointed with the last budget, for instance, when the uh, real terms increase of the territorial health boards was 3.8%, but the GMS uh, rise was only 1.9%. That just seemed to be um, seemed to be strange um, because of the issues we'd already seen. Um, so there's undoubtedly is going to be invest investment in general in health service in general. We just want to make sure that's inv invested in the right place. Um, we've got clear evidence from uh, Deloitte surveys about the effectiveness of, pr of primary care. Um, that's backed up by Helen Irvin's work, um, which shows that in the work she's done in Glasgow, um, that actually the, uh, it wasn't about lack of resources, but actually resourcing the wrong things. Um, and by investing a large amount in elective health care, you actually make inequalities worse. Now this backs up long-standing evidence from Barbara Starfield and others, um, which shows the investment in primary care uh, reduces inequalities um, and it actually improves mortality, when actually there's no clear evidence that that always happens when you invest in secondary care. Um, I'm very grateful that COF has been replaced and I'm very proud that the college came up with some of the concepts, particularly the basis of peer-based and values-driven approach, which underlines that. Um, I think this is going to be a major way forward. I think it's going to give us the structure to provide leadership um, and not only look at the intrinsic quality of the practice, but actually the extrinsic factors about how we work within the NHS, which has been a key part of the work I've been doing over the last two years. 
Okay, just to say that in, in terms, I think percentage isn't always the most helpful way to discuss this. We certainly need an absolute investment in general practice in particular. And by that, I don't mean necessarily coming into the GMS spend, which is technically where it would normally come, because we're actually saying that we don't want to expand the number of staff we employ, um, that we want to have other staff who assist us in doing the work that comes to practice, but we don't necessarily have to see that coming through my accounts, for example. Um, because we want to reduce the burdens of being an independent contractor to make it a more attractive future for GPs. Um, so we need to find ways of making sure that we can we can agree between us the money that comes that supports general practice uh, in its new role if we get to that stage, which is what we hope to with the new contract. And we will hopefully with government agree where we say that investment does come to support general practice. Because as Miles has said, Helena Irvin has shown that a lot of the investment that's gone to primary care has made no difference at all to general practice and the work that we do. Now, that's because of a different focus on how that spend works and the outcomes it's trying to achieve. We definitely want investment that improves the outcomes that we achieve through general practice. And that's going to require a new look at how we count it as spending that goes towards supporting general practice, as well as at that which directly comes through what we call the GMS spend. Didn't get the answers to my questions, which were: if I spend a pound on GPs, how much do I save at A and E to, to cut to the chase? And secondly, has there been any work done on how many hours a GP spends on stuff that they don't need to be doing? Well, can I come in? And the second one, I mean, there's been a lot of different work. It's very difficult to pick it apart because GP patients usually don't come with one thing. It's a bit like supermarkets; they come with more than five items. So basically, it's very difficult to say what would you not be doing, especially if GPs are extremely efficient. GPs are almost certainly the most efficient single person to do all of this. And actually, there's a good argument, cost effectiveness wise, simply to do all of this with more GPs because they're remarkably cost effective. I'll interrupt you there yes. because you've touched on a point that actually Dr. McNaughton brought up last week, okay. who was saying that uh, you know the, the cheapest and the most cost effective way was to get GPs to do absolutely everything, do it all in a winner, I think yep. was her, her expression. Um, but that wouldn't give the patient the best service. Well, I would disagree. I think it gives the patient a very good service, and it has done often. Now, there are, you know, but we're, we're not going to be able to do that. There aren't enough doctors, so we're changing that. And I think it does bring new aspects of quality of service to bring other professionals in because they bring in their own skills as well as those that a GP might have. But in terms of cost effectiveness, in terms of improving outcomes, GPs are remarkably cost effective at what they do. But it is probably true, based on a number of different people's opinions, that about 25% of the work that are the things I do in every day, someone else can do and possibly do better. So that's the kind of scale that we're talking about. And that might free up 30% of my time to deal with complex care, the new agenda for care for patients we have now, and also making the job more humane. Because many of our colleagues just now say the workload is inhumane and they're deciding deciding to get out of it one way or another, either by going part-time, leaving the profession. We had 259 GPs under 50 have left the profession in the last five years. 200 of those were under 40 when they decided to get out. So we have to change the role of a GP to make it a good job that's manageable in humane terms and dealing with the new complex world that we now have to deal with. And the best way, it is also true that GPs are happier working in a proper multi-professional team. I'm fortunate that I still have one. And it's a great team to work in. And the demarcation issues that you hinted at disappear when a team works well. Everyone knows what each other's role is, how best we are to deal with things, and we contribute equally to that effect. So once you get a good team working, the demarcation issues disappear. I've got some specific figures that Delight came up with um, for us in 2014 about potential savings. Um, on reduced A&E attendances and social admissions, it was between 26 and 37 million. A reduced ACSC admissions between 12 and 27 million, depending on low and high ratios. Decreased alcohol consumption between 4.7 million and 7 and 4.7 and 7 million. Smoking reduction between 5.6 and 9 million, giving a total um, estimate a range between 48.9 million um, and 81 million pounds. That's based on Deloitte figures, um, which are online at on my website. De uh, de best, um, based, I, um, I, the basis for this um, I would presume if this was meant that our, our um, of our campaign call was was um, noted, but I need to check that. Okay. You could send on to the, the, the yeah. clerks, that'd be super. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you for being there. 
Um, I'd like to go back to Richard's point about um, recruitment and especially how universities are helping to meet that demand. How do you feel the university sector is planning the workforce? I was told yesterday about Aberdeen University's 160 medical places. They've reduced the number for Scottish domicile um, by 12 for this current uh, year. How do you think we need to do more to say to the universities in Scotland they've got to have a larger percentage of Scottish students going in to study? And is that something the Scottish Government's failing to do, especially given how we fund universities and international students can actually bring £30,000 um, per course to that university? <laughs> So, so I, when I started my career in the NHS and I was involved in induction of the new junior doctors leaving medical schools, one of the questions I asked was, how many of you trained locally? And about 95% put their hands up. 20 years down the line, I, I'm lucky if that's 50% of, of the, 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 the new um, graduates that start with us. And I'm disappointed that Aberdeen University have, have reduced the number because we are struggling to recruit um, not just in primary care, but in other areas as well. And I would strongly um, emphasise the need to get local students in um, into the Grampian area. And that, when I mean local, I mean north of Scotland. I don't just mean uh, Grampian. I mean in Shetland and Orkney and Highland as well, because there is a bit of a move between these areas as well. And to what extent have government incentives like the £20,000 um, which has been provided, as well as the 100 additional training posts, going to make any difference, do you think? I think that £20,000 is only allocated to certain training schemes. So um, I think we've only got three in the north um, in, in that, because um, we have actually recruited relatively well this year for our GP training scheme, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's always going to be that way. Dr. I'm not an expert on this, but I mean, the universities seem to me they're almost just educational businesses and it's for government to influence how they operate. And as you've hinted at, there are other routes of them getting um, funding to go through. It is also true, and I think Miles done a lot of work, that the actual atmosphere regarding general practice in universities and medical schools is not positive towards general practice and it's fundamental that that changes. But in terms of the whole f workflow of, of new GPs coming through. There are lots of places where our potential GPs drop off getting into university. Um, once they've come through the, the foundation years, their choice of specialist training, and we need over 50% of them choosing to be GPs and they aren't. Um, and then well, even when they do that, they're often going, uh, they're, they're being lost to our workforce at the end of the training time. So we've got lots of places where we lose potential GPs and we have to fix that. Now we've asked the government and the, the minister did announce in, a, in our speech earlier this year at our conference, that she would um, produce a workforce plan. And part of that is how do we produce the number of GPs we need for the future? Now, that's going to be very difficult because we're both changing the role, the demands of the population are changing, and all the other workforces come into play. So it's actually a bit of a black art trying to predict how many GPs you need. You certainly need more now, and we certainly need to produce more than we're producing through our current system. But it will actually be a work in progress trying to say how many in the end do we actually need, and universities are fundamentally part of that. One thing just to add to that, actually, there's really good evidence that training doctors in general practice is good value. Not only will you provide more GPs, but actually those GPs, there is some evidence that those GPs who end up in hospital, those, those doctors who end up in hospital posts have got better communication skills, better able to deal with risk, um, um, and better use of resources because of the sort of training that they get in general practice. I was just going to get a and I think just in relation to that, so fully recognise all the, the factors that determine often where people will then end up after their training. But notwithstanding that, I still think there's a role for the healthcare system to engage as early as possible with that undergraduate um, group of individuals across all the disciplines and really entice and encourage them. We've got to work hard at that to, to retain them in our system. Thank you. I'd like to thank the, the panel for coming along this morning and speaking to the committee. I think it's been quite enlightening for all of us. Um, and uh, I'll now suspend the meeting briefly for a change of panel.
can't even want to. Uh, thank you for that. Um, we uh, welcome to the committee Shona Robison, Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport, uh, Richard Fogo, Deputy Director Primary Care, Gregor Smith, Deputy Chief Medical Officer, and Shirley Rogers, Director of Health Workforce, all from Scottish Government. Um, and I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to give an opening statement. Uh, well, thanks very much, uh, Convener. Um, I provided the, the committee with a, a written update on the progress that we've already made and what our next steps are in supporting general practice and transforming primary care. Um, it's fair to say, um, that, and I think I've said this before, um, that general practice is, of course, at the very heart of our NHS, with over 90% of healthcare delivered in primary care and over 24 million consultations in general practice every year. We've uh, must ensure that Scotland's GPs get the support they need to flourish. However, we know, of course, as you've heard, that general practice is under significant pressure and the, the scale and nature of demand is changing with uh, an ageing population, increasing complexity and, of course, the continued impact of health inequalities. And to meet these challenges, we can't continue to look back, but we have to focus on a, a vision for the future. So in December last year in Parliament, I set out my vision for a, a community health service at the heart of Scotland's NHS, a wider range of services provided by a, a highly skilled, wider group of professionals working as integrated teams, delivering care both in and out of hours, tailored to local needs. With Scotland's GPs providing leadership within these teams, along with an enhanced leadership role for Scotland's nurses, pharmacists, paramedics and other allied health professionals. In my written update, I've set out the outcomes and actions that will deliver that vision. We have uh, increased investment in our primary care fund to £85 million over three years. And to ensure that this investment makes a difference, we're testing new models of care in every health board area in Scotland with a focus on improving primary care, mental health and out of hours services. Over 80 tests of that new model are already underway. And of course, we've also committed to increasing the share of NHS funding in primary care year on year throughout this parliament. And as investment grows, we'll use that to support local areas to roll out the most successful tests. I think this is a measured and an evidence based approach to change. Uh, that if the, the future of primary care is multidisciplinary in nature, then the, the bulk of our investment should be in the primary care workforce. We've, of course, already taken a number of actions. We've increased GP training places from 300 to 400 per year. We've invested £2 million in GP recruitment and retention, including a rural medicine collaborative and, of course, deep end practices. And we've committed over £16 million to recruit 140 whole-time equivalent pharmacists in general practice. And in the programme for government, we've committed to increasing the numbers of GPs and nurses working in our communities, recruiting 250 community link workers to work with GPs in the most deprived communities and to train an additional thousand paramedics to work in community settings over the next five years. And I think this is the basis of long term change. But we know, of course, that the pressures faced by general practice are also here in the short term, which is why in March of this year, I committed an additional £20 million to provide immediate support to GPs and their practice staff. That included an uplift to pay and expenses of GPs. It supported the introduction of GP clusters. It introduced occupational health cover for GPs and ensured fair parental leave arrangement for GPs. These were all issues and priorities raised by the profession. 
themselves. But the longer uh, term changes uh, we seek cannot be delivered through the GP contract alone. Uh, they require changes to the wider workforce and infrastructure. But we are working uh, very effectively with the BMA to deliver a new GP contract from uh, 2017, uh, a collaboration which has already allowed us to abolish the bureaucratic quality and outcomes framework and to introduce GP clusters. I know that uh, everyone around this table is committed to the future of general practice in Scotland. We recognise the challenges, but I'm ambitious for the future uh, of uh, general practice and primary care, and I welcome this opportunity to discuss these plans with the committee. Thank you for that, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we'll now move to questions. Uh, Alex? Thank you, thank you, Cabinet Secretary, and thanks to the rest of the panel for joining us this morning. Uh, we had a protracted discussion in the last hearing um, as to how we would characterise the situation around workforce planning, particularly in the GP sector. And I'd be um, very keen to hear from each of the panellists individually as to whether you would characterise our current situation as a crisis, um, given that whilst more training places are being made, made available, those are not being filled. When they are filled, they're not always from Scottish domiciled uh, residents. And indeed, that despite maybe an uplift in headcount in the GP profession, we're actually seeing a drop-off in full-time equivalent to the point where we may be as many as 900 GPs fewer than we require by the end of the decade. So is this a crisis? Well, it is a challenging situation without a doubt, and I've never shied away from saying so, which is why I've spent a lot of my time, in fact, since becoming Cabinet Secretary, I've probably uh, spent more time uh, looking at the issue of the future of primary care and its importance in helping us to uh, develop a sustainable NHS and probably any other issue. So if I hadn't recognised there was a challenge, I wouldn't be doing that. I think we've also engaged very effectively uh, with, uh, with stakeholders in discussing what the solutions to those challenges are. There is no one quick fix. We've already accepted we need more GPs, but it's not just about the number of GPs, it's about what those GPs do. Uh, and of course, that's why the new GP contract is so important in uh, looking at a contract that supports new models of working, multidisciplinary models, utilising the skills and abilities of other staff to make sure that we get a sustainable model of primary care uh, going forward. So, you know, I've never shied away from, um, from being clear about the scale of the challenge. What's more important, though, I think, is what we do about it. You mentioned uh, the issue of Scottish domiciled uh, students and of course uh, in that respect we have taken a number of actions. We are increasing by 50 the number of uh, undergraduate medical places from this year onwards. We have been very clear with universities that we want the widening access agenda to feature very strongly uh, in uh, um, those additional places. And of course, we have uh, we are very, very well along the way with our plans for a new grad graduate medical uh, uh, school, which will have very a very clear focus on primary care and rurality. Uh, we are looking at how we can link uh, for example, the payment of uh, graduate fees to commitment to work within our NHS. The most important thing here is keeping uh, doctors who train here working in our NHS here. Now, many who might not be Scottish domicile do that. They, they train here and work here for long periods of time. Uh, what we want is more of them to choose general practice um, rather than other specialties that is one of the challenges and again we have been working with the the uh, medical schools to look at how we make general practice more attractive uh, and of course we have increased our training places to ensure that we give the opportunity and some interesting um uh, different different opportunities there with the GP fellows, for example, which is attracting quite a lot of interest and the, the, um, the, the bursaries as well. We have looked at a whole range of mechanisms to try and make uh, more young people go into medicine to choose general practice and to stay working here in Scotland. And the graduate uh, uh, programme will encourage a wider variety of people um, of all ages and all backgrounds, I think, to, to go into medicine, and that will be good for, for uh, the medical workforce here in Scotland. I don't, I don't 
minute doubt the sincerity with which you're approaching this problem, but would you characterise it as a crisis? Uh, no, I would, I would characterise it as being very challenging. I think we could sit and discuss terminology all morning. Would that really get us very far in terms of how we resolve the problem? I doubt it very much. What I'm focused on is coming up with a range of solutions that gets us to a point where people want to go into general practice, stay in general practice and work here in Scotland. That is not easy to resolve because it's partly about the, the uh, perception of general practice. It's about how our medical schools work and some of the the, um, the perhaps some of the, the perception within medical schools of where general practice sits in regard to other specialties. So these are quite deep rooted and complex issues. There is not one solution to them, which is why in the written material provided to the committee, why in the, the remarks I've made here today, we've touched on uh, a number of solutions right from uh, the recruitment and under, uh, undergraduate level through to the training, but all, the most important thing out of all of that is what the vision for primary care is. If we can create a vision for primary care here in Scotland that actually doctors want to be part of, then many more will choose general practice alongside other professionals who will want to work in primary care as opposed to other parts of the NHS. And hopefully that's what we can focus on here this morning. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Listen to you, I, I think you're starting to get the fact that you're thinking outside the box. My view is that we need more financial help for people to become doctors. Um, incentive, should we have incentives for people to stay uh, or go into GP practice? Um, should we have more uh, training places because it's, it's made out that a lot of people, a number of people fall off? I'm trying to actually get a constituent into a, a training place, but because he's short of a couple of points, the, the university uh, uh, is reviewing it, and I hope they do. Um, and and we're, you know, the point I was making this morning was I think there is possibly a situation of, and I'll use an old word, demarcation, that we could, if I walk into a, a doctor's, if, if I've got a, a cough, I should just go and see a nurse, not go and see the doctor. If I've got a sore finger, I should go and see the nurse, not not the doctor. You know, is there more things that we can do to try and a uh, reduce the amount of time that people are seeing uh, um, the individual doctor, where they could see a nurse or, or someone within that practice? Can we get doctors to look at the the situation of of working only uh, with the patient rather than trying to be a manager and employing all this and, and that into a, a sort of health um, a centre setting rather than their own practice. You know, do we start to think outside the box to resolve this, this challenge? Yes, we do need to do that. I mean, I should say that, you know, the role of the GP is, is pivotal. So the, the, that will continue to be the case. It has been the case, will continue to be the case. But what we're looking at that's new is you utilising more effectively the range of skills that sits within primary care and coordinating that through um, a, a, a genuinely multidisciplinary team environment. Now, that will allow, if we get it right, and I think I heard um, uh, Alan McDevitt at one point say that he thought that there was 25% 25, 25 of what GPs do could effectively be done by someone else. Now, that's not about a, le a lesser service. It's about recognising that whether it's medicines, reconciliation, pharmacists are absolutely, that's what they're trained to do, uh, or whether it's physiotherapists, uh, whether it's men uh, mental health workers. It's about making sure that the patient gets the best service utilising the skills of that wider team. Now, there's nothing earth shattering or, you know, it's a bit of a no brainer really, but it's about making it happen and ensuring that the contract supports that, that the, the model of working in primary care supports that. Um, and that's what we're, we're aiming uh, to do. Now, you mentioned the incentives. Uh, yes, we've put those in place. 
Um, the additional training places are important, and but it's it's a challenge to ensure that we um, fill those training places. And you know, I've, I've accepted it's a challenge. However, there are some um, positive signs in terms of the uh, the number of of applications, um, and you know, we're we're in a better place um, where we stand now than we were last year in that regard. But there's still more work to be done, and you know, making some of those. Uh, training places more attractive has been important as well, which is why we've looked at innovative um, ways of, of, of doing that with some success also. So all of those things that you have mentioned are important. There is not one thing that you know is the magic bullet here. We need to ensure that we have all of these things in place. And it is not going to happen overnight. We're not going to change the um, the perception of general practice or primary care overnight that is going to take time. We um, need to ensure that the testing of the new models um, is delivering the evidence that we need to be able then to roll out that. And there's some really really interesting uh, data beginning to emerge from those test sites that will stand us in very good stead as we do that. So, um, not one single answer, but all of the things you mentioned are important. Any of your officials, and you may want to come back to me, and sorry I keep pressing this, does any official uh, know how many people have refused a place to train as a doctor? I'm particularly interested in one case, but I'm sure there are many more out there, and, and I, want, I, I welcome anyone who is in a similar position to contact me. But I want to know how many people are being refused a place uh, to train as a doctor. Could, could I perhaps pick up on a couple of themes that perhaps relate back to your question as well, Mr. Cole Hamilton, if I may. Um, the, the, the context that we're operating in is that there is an international requirement for additional medical staff. That's not unique to the UK. It's not unique to Scotland. It's an issue that is around most of the developed world as the population ages and expectations of health increase. So um, our ability to recruit, train and retain our people is, has never been more important than it is at the moment. We also have the advantage of having in Scotland five very well regarded medical schools who attract candidates from across the world. And, and I think we would all wish it to be the case that Scotland's medical schools are highly regarded, highly reputed. So we know that Scottish medical schools attract a high number of international students. Coming to the point in respect of selection, because of those criteria, we know that Scottish universities are able to be quite discerning. Um, and we know that in, in the conversations that I have routinely with um, the Board for Academic Medicine, which is the group representing the medical schools in Scotland in, these, in this context, they and I are continuing to work on those selection criteria. We know that we get many more applications to Scottish medical schools than are taken. That's both in terms of Scots domicile students and in terms of international students. Um, and as we would all, I think, accept, we want the very best of the best in terms of Scottish medics. We want the people of Scotland to get the best medics that they can. What we've been working with the universities around over the last couple of years has been an identification of our issues of access and you're right Mr Lyle that there are people who aren't quite making into that space. We've been working very closely with the universities to look at their recruitment um, arrangements. Clearly it would be inappropriate for us to determine those, they have to meet all of the necessary academic tests, but we have been very clear with the universities that what we look to them to provide as a partnership with us to provide us, in my case me for the NHS in Scotland, with a supply of medics into that space. So we're very keen to work with them around access and Cabinet Secretary has already mentioned some of the ap approaches that we're taking in that space. The, um, there is evidence now that suggests that Scots domicile students are more likely to go on and practice medicine in Scotland. That's actually the case if you look at the analysis across the UK, that wherever you go to university, you're more likely to stay in the place that you went to university in order to practice. So it's our, in our interest to make sure that Scotland is as attractive as we can be. So whilst we're doing a number of things CABSEC has, has outlined to try and make that attractiveness more important, 
Um, we are also making sure that the attractiveness of the general practitioner role is critical. So the point that Alamut Devitt made earlier on about the 25 to 30% of the work that is being done by GPs not being appropriate for GPs is important, not just because it's wasteful, not just because it doesn't necessarily give the patient the best outcome, but also it's important because it doesn't make the GP role as attractive as it could be. So the work that Richard Foggo through the primary care design um, team is, is doing alongside of Alan and Mars and various other stakeholders is to make that role as attractive so that these highly mobile, well-educated and well-reputed doctors are attracted to stay in Scotland. And we seem to be making some progress in that respect. Things like the Clinical Fellows Programme has been very important in attracting and retaining people to stay in the Scottish pro process. If there are people who you believe are at the cusp that are inappropriately deselected, then that's something I'd be very happy to provide some further advice in respect of. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kinder. Thank you, Kinder. Um, I, I think probably what I'll take away from the session this morning is that we won't have a truly multidisciplinary approach if we don't have enough GPs. Um, in place. So I think this absolutely is an area where we have to concentrate focus. I mean, I, you know, figures suggest that the Scottish Government have, uh, that there's a 7% increase in GPs, but as I mentioned in the earlier session in Lothian, there are 39 restricted lists. So I would like to understand if that is actual headcount or whole time equivalents, because I sort of feel it doesn't quite add up. It seems slightly contradictory. And also we heard in evidence earlier this morning about a contradiction in approach. If we want to truly shift the balance of care from the acute sector to the community, you know, what impact are we having on health inequality through, while no one would suggest for a moment that we don't invest in elective procedures, for example, there's been a notable increase in consultants at a time when we are truly struggling to recruit enough GPs. So is the, I suppose, is the funding matching the intent? Is the funding and the focus matching the rhetoric? Um, okay, um, the the seven percent is 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 headcount. Um, the um, issue of more GPs, yes, we need more GPs. I've said we need more GPs, but we also need more nurses, pharmacists, um, and other health professionals in that multidisciplinary setting. The workforce plan uh, that will go along with the new contract and new models for primary care is very important in this context to make sure that we get that as accurate as we can um, and a lot of work is going on to make sure that alongside the, the new models and the contract underpinning that will be the investment plans and the workforce plans to ensure um, that we get the right number of GPs to, uh, to populate those new models alongside the right number of nurses, the right number of physios, the right number of other health professionals to make sure that multidisciplinary model can work effectively. So, so uh, absolutely. In terms of the, the funding um, going forward, uh, again, we have committed to an increasing share of funding going to primary care. Um, that is obviously going to be subject to um, meeting the needs of the new model of primary care. We're in the process of obviously negotiating a new contract. Part of that, um, uh, um, the outcome of that will obviously be, there will be a, an important funding element as, as part of the, the, the outcome of those negotiations to underpin the, 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 the new model that will be delivered. So uh, you, all of these things are, are hugely important. You mentioned tackling health inequalities. Um, I have said on a number of occasions, I'll say here again today, that I think that the, 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 the Scottish allocation formula and the way that we fund uh, practices needs to better reflect the health inequalities dimension of uh, the population that that practice serves. We have gone some way along the road of that with the, the formula and the funding of deep end practices, but I think uh, and believe very strongly actually that we can um, that that needs to be better reflected. Now, clearly, again, that was is part of um, a, a series of negotiations that we are having at the moment around the, the new contract. Um, obviously, it would be inappropriate for me to 
um, get into too much detail around that because they are, it is a negotiation. All I would say is it's going very well and those discussions are going well and there is um, a, a huge amount of common ground and, and agreement. Um, I think we also need to look at um, how we better link the primary care workforce with other elements of support that people living in communities of deprivation require. So the debate, the recent debate, um, you had raised the, the issue of ensuring that uh, we look at income maximisation, at uh, employability issues, all of the issues that, that surround individuals and families that impact on their health. I think through um, a new model of primary care, we can link more effectively into the world of integration, into welfare benefits support, into employability advice, all of that. There are some good examples of that. The Wester Hales Living Centre, for example, which is funded through the 2C mechanism, um, provides a one-door approach to all of those services. So there have been innovations already, even under the existing um, uh, contract and mechanisms that have led to quite you know innovative projects like that i think though um there is more scope to do more of that and ensure that when someone comes through the door whatever their needs that they can be met through that wider uh, team of people who um, can actually begin to impact on the health inequalities faced by that individual family and community thank you thank you Kimia. hey donald um, and add my thanks to you for coming today and for your letter of the, the 22nd of September. Um, in terms of funding, there's obviously a difference between primary, fair, primary care funding in general and funding general practice. Can I just ask um, quite simply, does the government have any plans to increase uh, the share of NHS expenditure that general practice receives? Well, um, yes, we want to increase the share of... Um, spend on general practice and primary care within the wider health budget we have made a commitment to in increasing the share of spend over the course of this parliament but we can't look at the funding of general practice in isolation from the funding of the wider primary care team if we accept as everybody around the table seems to have done that multidisciplinary working is the answer to how we deliver primary care services of the future then you know we have to invest in that wider primary care team but within that we will need more gps i've already said that in the program for government we're clear about that therefore uh, you know, we will need to increase uh, the, the, the number of GPs and therefore we will have to spend more on uh, ensuring that we have uh, an increased number of GPs. But we, to do that in isolation from the funding of the wider primary care team uh, would be a mistake because we would not get primary care into a sustainable position with the uh, we wouldn't tackle the issue of 25% of a GP's workload being able to be effectively done by someone else. So we wouldn't maximise the, uh, the efficiency of our primary care uh, model and service if we were not to invest in that wider primary care team. So yes, we will need more GPs and therefore we will need to ensure that we fund uh, that additional uh, workforce. But that has to sit within the context of uh, an increasing share of uh, funding on primary care more generally. Otherwise, we're not going to get to a sustainable model that we need. Thanks. Thanks very much, Cabinet Secretary. There was two areas I wanted to quickly touch on. One's around about um, preventive spending. And you'll have heard I asked the same question in the earlier session. And it was, do you have any analysis or data around about if you spend money in GPs or in the wider primary care, how much that saves you by reduced admissions to A&E and into the acute sector. Um, and the second thing was around about the pilots. Now, there's a great big list of pilots, and, and that's great. You're trying a lot of different stuff, I'm assuming, to see what works. Um, can you elaborate a wee bit more on the process of how you'll evaluate the success of those pilots, what, what are you looking for in terms of what you're measuring? Um, and also, is there an issue, I think we had in one of the earlier sessions around about a lot of the pilots, the fundings for a limited period of time, um, and, 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 and how will that kind of roll out? I'm assuming what you'll do is then figure out which ones work and then have a mechanism for rolling those out across the country. Yeah, 
I'll, I'll bring Richard in in a minute just on some more of the detail. But you know, we we didn't magic up these test sites. These were this was done in partnership with localities, with boards and partners locally who have uh, essentially taken the, the the direction of travel that we're all heading in and have localised that into a model that they want to test out that meets their local needs. There's nothing wrong with that because areas are, are different. We have rurality, we have uh, deprivation. So you know the the the, the model the multidisciplinary model is the, the common thread but the specific application of that will be slightly different from area to area and there's nothing wrong with that what we're going to do in terms of evaluating the models is to take that evaluation and an ongoing process so we're not going to wait till five years down the line and say oh well we think that works it's an ongoing process um, and many of those test sites will then be embedded as the way that primary care will be delivered in that locality. We will be getting a change, significant change in visibility of change by as early as next year. I, I um, believe, and Richard will say a bit more about that, and over a two to three year process, um, we will be embedding those new models and rolling out uh, the, the practice and the learning from that elsewhere um, alongside our funding plan, investment plan, and our workforce plan to really um, scale that change up to um, ensure that really what we see um, in primary care uh, in the next few years um, is you know, dramatically transformed from where we are at the moment. Do you want to say a little bit more about sure. this? Um, I would just emphasise what the Cabinet Secretary said. I mean, the, at the heart of this is a deeply collaborative model. So. Uh, the wisdom for this doesn't lie in St Andrew's House. So the first thing to say is we're working with every health board area, every integrated joint board to determine and support the work that they want to do to deliver those outcomes. So in a sense, our evaluation is really supporting them evaluating their local practice. So we are working through the Scottish School of Primary Care to put on top of that a national evaluation, which will allow us to identify some of the key themes and then really to determine what's appropriate to be determined locally, regionally and nationally. So again, I don't think it will be a classical top-down rollout of one solution. Um, I, I've considered the evidence today and the evidence last week. There's a multiplicity of models out there to suit rural environments, urban environments and different demographics. Our job, I think, is to determine what the national components of that support would look like. So in particular, perhaps workforce <laughs> supply and infrastructure supply. So some of the IT and digital and data issues I know that you've taken evidence on, again, lend themselves to a once for Scotland approach and don't lend themselves to being done 30 times or 14 times. But again, it's determined by local change. So our, our, our piloting work is determined by what locally was already happening and we look to support and get behind that. That means there's a sense of ownership and a sense of direction rather than a sense of from St Andrew's House, a strategy that people have to comply with. So there, there is a risk there. There's a lot of tests. There's over 80, possibly up to 100. But that's a distinct advantage. There's a key underlying theme, which is the multidisciplinary working in the context of integration. So we will begin to form themes, begin to gather the knowledge, and begin to determine what we can do nationally to support those local efforts. Uh, but the local efforts are driving the change. Spent. Well, I mean, the... the a lot of the the new model of multidisciplinary working and the the, in the some of the information um, that I gave to Alison Johnson around ensuring that we um, provide a joined up approach through primary care, linking in with other parts of the public sector, if you like, whether that's on um, uh, welfare advice, on debt counselling, on uh, employability, on educational opportunities. I think all of that is really important in, I suppose, what you could collectively call preventive spend. It's trying to ensure that we are um, working, using our primary care um, infrastructure and uh, workforce to prevent ill health and intervene early. Uh, I, th I think we are, we've never, we've not been as effective at doing that as I think we could. I think this new model can help us do that because it's by its nature, it 
opens up the opportunity for multidisciplinary working like the, the Westerhills uh, Living Centre, which I would encourage you to get along to and have a look if you've not um, had that opportunity. It very much um, has preventive um, work as it's as its core, it's about intervening early, it's about um, enhancing life chances, and everybody from the GP through to the welfare rights worker to the voluntary group all have a focus of trying to build resilience within individuals, families and communities, as well as obviously providing a, a health service. I think there's a lot we can take from, from that. Now, not every community you know that won't necessarily be the model for every community because some will be more sparsely populated than than western hills is but the concept of multidisciplinary working is the same but joining the dots bringing in all those skills and expertise involving the voluntary sector more effectively to provide a a support to individuals families and communities that um i think could be better provided yeah, I no but if you spend a pound up, upstream, how much do you save downstream? Yeah, um, I mean, there is very, that, that data is available. We can provide that to you. I'm very happy to write to you with that data. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm just very mindful of the time, so if we could keep our questions and, and answers, say, uh, brief and to the point, if possible. Uh, Colin. Th thanks very much. I mean, all the evidence that we're getting from, from, from GPs and, and on this year, GP hubs, very much points to the, a unanimous view that this is the model, this is the way forward, the whole multidisciplinary team approach. Um, but, but last week the convener made the comment that, that there are more pilots than there are at Heathrow. And, and Audit Scotland have indicated that the, the, the shift to the new model of care is not happening fast enough. They go on to say that the Scottish Government need to provide stronger leadership by developing a, a clear framework to guide local development and consolidating evidence of what works. Are there any plans to provide that? framework to help um, uh, local development and if so when and when will we move really from all the pilots to an agreed position where this is actually the way forward that, that, and this is the, the sustainable model with sustainable funding yeah i mean this isn't a, a case of you know we're going to have these these pilots and then you know we'll we'll get around to evaluating them and then we'll maybe do you know carry on with some it's not like i mean a test site is is quite different it is about changing the way things work and then you know if, if if that is successful and we believe it will be because it's based on evidence it's about then ensuring that that change happens uh, across that area the reason we've given some flexibility um although the the common the commonality of all of these test sites is multidisciplinary working so we've not you know that there, there are none that sit outside the thrust of the the way we want and have agreed um, that, uh, that, that primary care should go forward in the future. So multidisciplinary working is, and the, and the, the kind of basis of, of the bids was all around a, a set of criteria that was common to all, but the application of them took into account rurality, deprivation, um, the assets of that, that locality, um, and what, they, what that locality believed would be the most effective application of the model. So the the national evaluation and the ongoing support is there. Richard made mention of it earlier on, but I'm sure he can give you more detail. We then en envisage um, essentially ruling out that practice with some changes. There will inevitably be changes along the way in the light of the experience of the test sites. Um, we will underpin that new model nationally with the infrastructure investment and workforce plans to ensure that we can get the the people to populate that on a scaled up basis um, and um, that work is ongoing at the moment as we build those supporting plans to the test sites uh, i think the thing i would add again is just to get the balance right here so where leadership has been needed it's been taken so the removal of quaff and introduction of gp clusters uh, was something that was done i think based on evidence but not based on test or pilots. We're seeing that develop. So where there are opportunities where there is collaboration and consensus around steps we might take, those steps have been taken. So the introduction of GP clusters, I think, is an enormously significant move towards a multidisciplinary future. Now, those are in a very early stage, but that was a step that was taken, which is a very significant step, which we're looking at at the moment. So there's a balance here between local leadership and determining what is su suitable for local purposes, and then where necessary, 
through negotiations and broader collaboration, taking national steps, I think, to address immediate concerns. So the removal of COF and the introduction of GP clusters is a very significant sign of leadership in that context. And what about the, can you just add a little bit around the um, evaluation and roll out beyond? Yeah, so um, just to um, build on the point before, we're working with the Scottish School of Primary Care to provide some national support, but each project we're working with has its own evaluation. And uh, in visiting a number of these sites, the, the, the local areas are seeing this as part of their own development plans. So this is not something they're doing contracted by us. This is something which, from their lo local purposes, that they are developing. So these changes aren't waiting for national approval. Very many of the test sites that you have in the list are test sites which are happening, which we are supporting, which would be happening anyway, which to, to, to meet the changing demand and the changing demographics locally, these changes are being made. So we will capture the key national themes and we will provide the national leadership required around workforce and infrastructure and funding in particular. But the change that's needed in Shetland, Stranraer, Dumbarton, you know, and Dunbar are going to be really quite different. That configuration is a configuration for local partners to determine. Thank you, Convener, and thank you for the, to the panel for coming in this morning. Um, a few weeks ago, we had an evidence session regarding GP hubs, and the, those on the panel who were involved with establishing them across Scotland couldn't actually give us a definition of what they thought the GP hub should be and the allied health professionals associated with them. So I'd be interested to know from the Cabinet Secretary what definition she would give a hub. And then my second point is regarding link workers. What qualifications um, will a link worker have? What training? And specifically, what role do you envisage them having within a hub setting? Okay. Well, the, the hub is really multidisciplinary working. Uh, the application of that hub, of course, will be different in different localities. So in a rural or very remote area, you won't necessarily have a multidisciplinary team all working out of the same premises because of the nature of the, of the geography. But you can have them working as a multidisciplinary team nonetheless. Um, it will just look and feel a bit different, but the outcome should be the same and that all those dots are, are joined up. The, the team is working as one with the hopefully bringing in the, the wider uh, 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 skills, uh, whether it's well, welfare rights, debt counselling, or, or any of the, uh, the social care um, staff, all of the things we've already talked about. Um, the, the hub and that multidisciplinary um, team model will apply uh, out of hours and the, the urgent uh, care hubs that will apply in the, the community health hubs that you've, you've heard a lot about. The common theme here is multidisciplinary working. So ho ho professionals you then say should be attached to a hub? Definitely a physiotherapist. I think there'll be a core um, because, again, if you look at a remote community and the skills available in that health and care team will be a little bit different, perhaps, to an urban setting because of the nature of the population. It's more sparsely populated, smaller. So that, that rain, the range of health and care and voluntary sector uh, skills available will be a little bit different in a remote and rural community than it would be in an, in an urban area. But the principle is the same. And I would see the core as being that kind of core set of health uh, and, and care professionals. Um, but be it with, out with that core will be the voluntary sector, will be some of the other skills that can be pulled in Clearly, as I've said already, that will vary from community to community, but the, the core of multidisciplinary working will be, you know, your, your pharmacist, your physio, your nurse, your, obviously with the GP at the heart of that, pulling uh, all, of, all of that together and, and being the, kind of the clinical uh, leadership um, that is going to be so critical for, for that to work. Um, in terms of the link worker, well, we already have the link worker model working pretty effectively out there. What we said is that we want to ensure that we uh, um, increase the, the numbers of, of link workers. We've uh, talked about the, the two and made a commitment to the 250. Um, I know that um, you've expressed some concern about um, whether or not they would have the, the skills um, needed to address some of our mental health issues. And what I'd say to that is that 
coming back to Alison Johnson's point about how do we ensure that we tackle health inequalities, part of that will be ensuring the person gets to the right place, the right person. Um, we will need to, through our investment in the, the £10 million pounds into um, me mental health in a primary care setting, look at how we ensure the availability for signposting to mental health services. Some of that will be utilising more effectively the statutory and voluntary sectors that exist, but some of that will be additional capacity. Maureen Watt is looking at how do we increase the resilience of, of mental health services within the school environment, for example. So again, the link worker's role will be to ensure that the, the person gets to the right source of advice. Some, and that will depend on what their need is. Some of that will be um, perhaps very early intervention, um, but some of it will be more, um, more complex in nature. The link worker, I think, is the key, though, to the, it could be the glue in making sure that the, uh, the person gets to the right place. Um, hi there. There's a couple of things I wanted to ask about. Um, firstly, the issue of data sharing has come up in terms of the challenges that provides to the multidisciplinary team model that you described. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about some of the solutions um, that you propose for that. And the other thing I wanted to raise was the question of Brexit and the impact um, that that might have on our NHS workforce. I know that 5% um, of doctors working in Scotland are EU nationals and 15% of the social care workforce are EU nationals. I know that I, I represent the Highlands and Islands region and I hear anecdotally from some of the island boards that they think that they have a higher proportion of EU nationals working there in some of the areas that are harder to recruit. Um, so obviously it's causing a, you know, a reasonable level of concern already and I wonder if there's anything you'd like to say on that. Yep. Would it be helpful for the Cabinet Secretary to perhaps write to us about the legislative changes and data protection that sure. issues? Sure, happy to do that, um, yep. I mean, it is a big issue that absolutely, we need to resolve. Absolutely, and I'm just and, mindful yep. of our, yep. our time here. Okay. Happy <laughs> <laughs> to write with more information on the, the, the data sharing. The issues you raise about EU nationals and, um, and Brexit is, a, is an important one. We want to... Uh, keep people working here in Scotland, uh, whether they are EU nationals or, or not. Um, I think Brexit throws up some real challenges there, but the message I would want to put out here and in any other opportunity is that they are welcome. Uh, we want them working here in our NHS and uh, we, we want them to stay working here in our NHS. And we will be looking at how we can help to, to encourage them to do so. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary, and to the rest of the panel. Um, we'll now take a short adjournment uh, so that the panel can change.
it over. Um, we have the third item on the agenda today, and it's an ev evidence session on social and community care workforce. Uh, and we welcome to the committee uh, Shona Robison, Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport, Jeff Huggins, Director of Health and Social Care Integration, Alan Baird, Chief Social Work Advisor, and Sarah Gle Gledhill, a sponsor team lead for the Scottish Social Services Council, all of the Scottish Government. And I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement. Okay, uh, well, well, thank you for the invitation. Um, and I think uh, hopefully you'll recognise the importance of this government's commitment to integrating health and social care, to ensuring that people have the access to the right care in the right place at the right time. Um, as people live longer in Scotland and often with complex support needs, we have to work innovatively and collaboratively with colleagues across health and social care and of course with communities themselves to ensure that services support people as far as possible to stay in their own home and communities for as long as possible. We know that that's generally what's best for people's well-being and we also know of course that's what people want. Our new health and social care partnerships all became operational on the 1st of April this year and they have the real power to drive change planning, designing, commissioning services in an integrated way from a single budget enables them to take a more joined up approach, more easily shifting resources to uh, target preventative activity and taking uh, more holistic approaches to care and support, which will improve the experience and outcomes for all of the people who use the services or need support. We spend nearly four billion pounds each year on social care support, and it's vital that we use this resource in the most effective way to deliver the best uh, outcomes uh, for the people of Scotland. Health and <coughs> social care integration provides us with the opportunity to do that and to be uh, more creative and innovative in the way that we deliver care. We know that investing resources in community services rather than acute settings and improving links between care in hospitals and care in communities does improve outcomes. I recently uh, announced our plans for uh, East Lothian Community Hospital, which is a good example of how the different care sectors can work together to ensure that care is joined up and delivered closer to home and family with facilities for daycare services. We've already signalled our commitment to resourcing care in the community by allocating a further £250 million from the NHS to health and social care partnerships to protect and expand social care services and deliver our shared priorities. That includes, of course, our commitment to enable the living wage to be paid to care workers supporting adults from the, the 1st of October. Services need to be fully flexible to meet a person's needs and to empower them to co-produce and self-direct their support, making choices about how their care can be best delivered. This shift does require fundamental change across the whole system and culture from decision makers to the frontline staff who provide that care and support on a daily basis. Uh, to achieve transformational change, it's vital that staff are fully supported. Our statutory outcomes for health and well-being, which underpin integration, address the importance of staff engagement and support. And partnerships are required to publish annual performance reports setting out their progress in relation to the outcomes. And we'll, as you've heard from others, the landscape for the social and community care workforce is complex, and we all recognise that we must work across all partners and stakeholders to ensure that we have enough people with the right skills to support the needs of people with it, with a variety of, of, of needs within communities. Um, <clears throat> we're committed to ensuring the entire workforce is fully supported. That's why, in addition to the investment that I mentioned earlier, we remain committed to upskilling our uh, workforce, and uh, that is a, a policy which is wider in scope than anywhere else in the UK at the time when the policy was introduced, around 80% of the workforce did not have any qualifications. Now, through the work of employers and bodies such as the, the Scottish Social Services Council and the Care Inspectorate, around 100,000 uh, of the people in this workforce are registered. They have or are working towards the qualifications required for their role and their fitness to practice can be regulated. I think that is progress. 
We're also working with partners on the Social Work Services Strategic Forum and the HR Working Group on Integration, supporting a range of actions to strengthen this workforce and demonstrate how it's valued. And finally, we're clear that we can't do this alone, so the committee's interest in this area provides a timely opportunity to consider both the progress made and the challenges that we need to work on together with all of our partners, many of whom you heard from at your session on the 13th of September. Cabinet Secretary, uh, we'll now move to questions. Uh, Donald? Yes, um, this is a slightly specific question. We heard from Annie Gunnar Logan, who I think represents the voluntary care providers, and, and it's really about Brexit again. Um, because she said, from, uh, speaking from memory, that when she asked her staff about Brexit and the implications, um, one of the points they mentioned was that there was an opportunity in terms of um, lessening the burden of rules around procurement and tendering and that was a potential opportunity that that was coming out of, of brexit i wondered if you had any observations about that um well i think whatever the the arrangements that we have there will always be rules around procurement and tendering because of the need for for transparency um in whatever um, a constitutional arrangement there will always be needs for for openness and transparency and to ensure that um, that due process is done and seen to be done in the the spending of public money however what I would say to you is that um, in terms of the, the concerns about Brexit is if you look at the social care workforce and where many of uh, those social care workers come from, I am extremely concerned that the potential loss of um, social care workers who come from uh, parts of Europe who support our care services, particularly within our, our, our care home sector, I think is something we should all be extremely concerned about. And again, I would want to take the opportunity to say send out a message to that social care workforce that no matter where you come from, um, your work here is valued and we want you to remain working here, whether it's in our care home sector or our care at home sector. On that subject, um, one of the problems that the, the panel two weeks ago uh, mentioned was it's very hard to actually estimate uh, how many um, non-UK EU nationals are working in the social care workforce. Is the government doing anything to establish uh, what those numbers might be? Well, I'll let um, Jeff come in on, on that in a second, but I think it's certainly um, very visible to me as I go around, particularly the care home sector um, and to some degree the care at home sector, but certainly within our care home sector, if you go into <coughs> care homes uh, length and breadth of Scotland and you speak to the staff, you will find that many of them uh, have come from other parts of Europe, both within the social care workforce and our nursing workforce working within care homes. Um, that is very visible to me. Alan probably will have a bit more um, data and information on, on the numbers, but I think with, with, you know, it's um, not unreasonable to say that uh, the loss of, of uh, that cohort of staff who do a hugely important job here would be a blow to the sector and one that we want to avoid which is why um you know my my message is we value and want you to remain working here in the sector and do you want to say a word about the, the, the makeup of the we work? don't i think it was probably noted at the meeting of the fifth that we don't currently know are the the numbers that, that currently from the eu and beyond uh, currently working in the workforce but it's it's something i think increasingly we will need to understand uh, in order to uh, look at the potential um, gap that, that may exist within social care and, um, jeff do you want you wanted to come in yeah. um two, two things first you, the the point that was made by Annie Gunnar Logan in respect of procurement, it's, it's an interesting point because part of the challenge that we have around delivering the living wage is the legal framework within which we can specify contract rates. So, so there is a question as to what would happen next uh, in the context um, of Brexit. I, I think the other component of that, though, is we then don't know what the next step beyond Brexit would be in respect of whether that would be a reserved matter or a devolved matter, um, and, a, and if it were a reserved matter, how that would be handled in the broader context of UK policy on, um, on earnings. 
we're, we're certainly conscious of the issue um, in respect of non-UK nationals working within the workforce. Um, and in that space, we're, I guess we would also be careful about the degree to which that patterns across the country in, in different ways and is likely to affect different components of the um, service delivery differently as you look across Scotland, um, particularly issues, and I think you were given evidence on this previously around island authorities, but also in respect of more remote and rural authorities, particularly in the North East. So it's an area that we, we will um, are and will be discussing with the partners group, um, which is the providers, but also Unison, that we've been working with more generally in Turkey, taking forward some of the reforms. So it's, it's, it's right in front of our in front of us at the moment. I think Sarah was going to add a, a little bit about data collection. Oh, yes. As I'm sure that um, you know that the SSSC collects annual data on the social services workforce and we are discussing with them whether we might be able to add a question that will enable us to collect more accurate information on this topic. Uh, there about uh, the Scottish living wage and can you perhaps give us an update on progress towards the implementation of that across social care? Before Jeff comes in on that, can I say that people have been working very, very hard across the, the partnerships to ensure delivery from the 1st of October, and I want to put on record my, my thanks to all of them for doing so, because it has been quite a, a big undertaking, um, and a lot of hard work uh, is being done, but I think we're in a, a good place. Um, Jeff? Yeah, I, I think to say, um, and as the evidence that you heard previously, and I imagine also as you're hearing separately from the evidence, this is a remarkably challenging undertaking to take uh, to take to take forward. Um, we are working directly with CCPS and with Scottish Care, uh, as well as with Unison and COSLA. Um, and I, I spoke with CCPS and Scottish Care this morning, just in terms of both um, their update, but also sharing our understanding of what's going on. So we are working um, carefully across partners, both to triangulate what's happening within local negotiations, but also from that to take a national. Uh, picture. Where, where we are is that we know in many areas good progress has been made, in, in other areas negotiations are continuing and, and part of the challenge is, to this is it's not simply uh, a find the right number and then roll it out in that this is built up of hundreds of local negotiations with individual providers who have historically offered different terms and conditions to their workforce. So this is not a small scale uh, undertaking. Um, we are confident um, on the basis of the work that we're doing, in, in, including work with individual partnerships in respect of how the progress is going. And I, I've, again, I'm speaking with chief officers and procurement officers on a regular basis to understand, but also to ensure um, that, we, that we deliver this. Um, what, what is clear is that we are still resolving some issues locally, um, but we are confident that we will meet the commitment that the benefit of the living wage is achieved from the 1st of October. Colin? Thanks very much, Kavina. It's obviously on the living wage that I'd quite like to pick up on uh, some of the points. I mean, presumably there'll be lessons learned from the approach that's been taken so far. You make the point that you're still literally working up until the 11th hour to try to make sure that everybody does get the living wage from which is effectively Saturday. Um, some of the evidence we took from Annie Gunnar Logan pointed out the fact that providers weren't consulted on the implementation of the policy. Effectively, they read about it in the newspaper. So I'm keen to know um, what, what you're going to do in future to involve stakeholders in developing the policy to make sure it's sustainable in the long term. Um, also, just in terms of the actual funding, I think it's widely recognised that the national estimate of £37 million put forward by the Scottish Government very much underestimated the actual cost. So what assessment are you going to make of what the, the real cost has been to actually implement the policy, hopefully from the 1st of October? And, and just a final question. I'm keen to get clarity on, on um, the actual payment for sleepover shifts. Is it the Scottish Government's position that sleepover shifts should be paid at the living wage rate? And, and is that going to be the case from the 1st of October? And if not, when from? Um, so... The £250 million obviously, that we provided for social care has, um, within that, um, part of that was for the delivery of the living wage. That was uh, um, an ambitious undertaking, and Jeff has outlined the complexity of, of some of that. But I think there has been a willingness and determination on the, the, base, the, on the part of all partners 
to make this happen because it's a good thing and will help to encourage people to stay within the, the caring profession and hopefully will bring others to work in the caring uh, profession. The complexity, of course, has been partly that this is uh, subject to um, the, the negotiation by local partners because they are the ones uh, through the, the um, commissioning and procurement of services that, that needed to actually have deliver the mechanism of paying the living wage. So while we have provided the resources, the mechanics of that needed to be delivered locally. Um, and of course, in each area, some um, partnerships were further along the road of already towards the living wage than others. So the distance to be travelled was different in different areas. Um, and again, that meant that the resourcing required by that partnership plus uh, w was, was going to be different in, in different areas. So there has been a complexity to this. That will become easier, I think, because we now have data and information that we didn't really have before, both at a local level and a national level. Um, and in terms of sustaining the, the, the policy in the long term, yes. And as I think I said to your question in the, the health debate, um, part of our discussions with COSLA um, and our partners in the care sector are about ensuring that going forward, as part of the spending review, we are in, in, ensuring the continual delivery of the, the living wage. And that is a, an important um, priority for us. Um, in terms of sleepovers, um, uh, that is an issue that is still being discussed because of, again, of the complexity of the way sleepover payments are paid. And um, the partners have asked for more time to, um, to talk about the resolution of that. And as I understand, I think the, um, the, the unions have been party to those discussions to ensure that it is resolved, but it's going to take more time to resolve that. And again, we um, will um, be um, helping and working with those local uh, partners to ensure that, um, that those discussions are, are taken forward and, uh, and taken forward um, as quickly as possible. Um, Jeff, do you want to add in? Yeah, m m m m maybe a few things. You've asked about lessons learned, and as the Cabinet Secretary said, what we've effectively asked partners to do is to use the existing system for um, retendering and renegotiating. I think we've taken a number of elements of learning out of that, so I've, I've got a, a, sh a list of about four or five things that I would now take away from the process and think about for next year, because we'll be looking to, to think about how we approach this as, as, as time moves on. A key component of the, that, though, is the change in the nature of the commissioning and procurement relations. So historically, this would have been a local government commissioned and a local government procured service. So this is now a integration authority commissioned service and a local government procured service. And that potentially gives us a, a more of a discussion mm -hmm. as to whether we might look differently as to how we take forward the procurement now that it's separate from the commissioning role. So there's a, there's a key change which has taken place under integration. So we're looking at questions like for um, maybe some of the more niche providers um, in learning disability or, or mental health who provide across a number um, of authority areas, of integration authority areas, whether we should be looking at perhaps a lead um, procurer for that, um, but also looking at, 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 at questions about the uh, the degree to which similar providers find that they're being made different offers from a, adjoining authorities and, and the, the challenges around that. So we are learning the lessons. We we talked about it with the chief officers when we met with them 10 days ago and we talked to, I spoke about it, there's one of the issues that was on my agenda this morning with both um, Annie and Donald McCaskill. In terms of the cost assessment, the information that we lodged in SPICE at the end of 2000 and, I'm going to say 2015, um, was an assessment in which we were very explicit about the presumptions that we'd been made. Um, and I know that some of those presumptions were questioned when, when you met last time. Um, we then, as part of the local government negotiation, and it would have been challenging, I think, to have involved the providers in the negotiation between the Deputy First Minister and COSLA as to what the local government settlement should consist in, um, although we understand their, frust their frustration in, in that space. We then, as part of that, invited local partnerships to consider what they believed the local cost would be, and it offered our information as support to that as, as, as part of the process by which they considered the use of the 125 million. So while we did put information into the system, we didn't say this was the figure. 
And we said this is the figure based on these presumptions and based on the knowledge that we have. And we invited local partnerships to make their own assessment of what the appropriate cost would be. And most appear to have done that um, adequately. Um, in terms of the, sorry, I've covered the third, the third thing was process of involvement. We are also talking about how we do that in, for the next round and for the, the coming period of time. And the process that we've built with the partners group, which is the Scottish Government, COSLA, CCPS, Scottish Care and, and um, the unions, we think is a, is a good methodology for taking that forward for future years. Just come back on that. Um, I understand fully that the complexities that 7,000 social care providers across Scotland and, and 31 IGBs is a complex process. But we have a national framework in place when it comes to care homes. Looking forward, is, is there any consideration being given to a national framework when it comes for care at home? It, it's probably less straightforward because while the majority of the service that we're looking at here is for older people in terms of things such as um, personal care, and assistance with, with daily living. Once we take a step into um, some of the substance misuse services, learning disability, and things like mental health, the idea that you'd have a single rate that covers um, a, a range of complexities becomes more challenging. So um, there are also different ways in which services are locally stitched together between health and care, which means that the burdens that maybe fall on social care and health services will be different depending on where you are. So, so it, it, we are, as part of the reform process, looking at those questions, but it may be less straightforward than it is for residential care. Indeed, part of the work that we're doing on the residential care is suggesting that increasingly the distinctions between different forms of residential care are raising the question about whether we need slightly different approaches there. But we, you know, ultimately, the objective is to try and provide and fund services in a way which provides support for the different needs of individuals rather than reducing them to a common minimum. Thanks. Thank you, convener, and I'd like to welcome the panel this morning as well. Um, one of the biggest impacts on the environment in terms of workforce planning, aside from integration, has been the advent of self-directed support. I'd just like to hear from the panel their reflections on how that has impacted on workforce planning, but also that we've heard from health boards that a number of us have received briefings from of provider behaviours in response to self-directed support, which haven't been entirely helpful. Um, but yeah, so I, I think just a reflection on the impact of self-directed support on the workforce planning agenda in social care. Well, I uh, was the, the Minister for, for Public Health at the time when, when we were taking uh, forward uh, uh, initially in the initial stages the, the whole um, uh, concept of, of self-directed support and then of course the, the legislation which followed. And I think out of of everything that has been done, it has got the potential to be one of the most innovative programmes and, and concepts. It's all about empowering people, putting the <clears throat> the person in the driving seat of their of their care, and uh, um, making sure that um, that the, the the services are are, are built around the or the person is involved in building the services around themselves rather than necessarily um, services that, that are provided to them that don't meet their, their needs. So the concept, I think, is, is fantastic. I guess, to be honest, it's work in progress that we have um, provided a, a lot of support to make this happen. Um, there's resources that have gone in to ensure that um, we can embed the, the whole process of self-directed support across the, the social care sector to build the workforce to make sure that um, that um, that anyone who wants access to self-directed support to deliver their the care that they need has access to it. I think we are in a better place than we were previously around the 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 whole culture of accepting self-directed support. I think initially there was maybe a little bit of resistance to you know would this threaten in some way the, the kind of statutory service model. I think less so now. I think people have accepted that this is a, a good option for people that um, is actually not a threat to existing services, but actually can be an enhancement to them. Um, Jeff, do you want to, to say a little bit more? A, a, a couple of things. We've, we've, we found, we found um, self-directed support being used in really quite innovative and novel ways, particularly in rural communities. So one of the examples which I 
often give us the Boleskin care um, from the banks of Loch Ness in an area where they find it very difficult to um, recruit a social care workforce or persuade one to travel that distance. And instead they went into the community and identified people who would be prepared to do a few sessions a week using self-directed support to provide care for people who lived in their neighbourhood. And, and that worked within, uh, within a way which was, which was very effective. I, I'll be interested to see how the... Um, because you identified some pro provider behaviour, largely... I would, I would assess driven by the previous approach around compulsory competitive tendering. And, and as we're seeing maybe a, a move away from that and price and you know, the degree to which quality is in that being the dominant factor, uh, and as we're seeing pay increase and the values of contracts change, whether that will continue to be the, 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 you know, the, 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 that will be a continuing factor. So I think there's a question as to whether that as a reaction to CCT um, will continue to be as forceful, and you know the comments in the auditor uh, general for Scotland's report from uh, from last week, I think around the impact of CCT are really helpful there. I think the bigger challenge around this, around some of the services which we also see around day services, is the degree to which there's a, an increasing diversity of what people are looking for in terms of the support that they receive, and that's going to be difficult to to work through. But it's something that we need to do. I should have added and removed the Scottish Government's invested 58.6 million in transition to SDS between 2011 and 2016 17, and some of that has been very much around building the workforce, the innovation fund. Um, but Alan, I think you wanted to yeah, say something I, on work. I, I've, I've spent quite a lot of time over recent months uh, visiting large providers uh, um, and with, you know, local authorities, smaller uh, organisations within the third sector, and met with uh, a cross section of frontline social workers to hear really about their experience. First of all, we're halfway through a 10 year strategy. And uh, as the Cabinet Secretary said, this, this was. This was a complex, the, the money that government provided to put in place the right infrastructure was considerable. And I think we, as a result, we've made really good progress. And when you talk to those that are in receipt of self-directed support, making, making the, the, the right opportunities from the choices that they have, they are seeing their lives change in quite innovative ways. If you talk to some of the providers though, um, national providers get really frustrated about the number of different sets of forms that exist across Scotland. So if you're a national organisation and you're working with a number, quite a number of local authorities, you can expect with 10 local authorities you might get 10 sets of forms. That's time consuming. And within the current uh, resources that we have and what self-directed support ought to be about, I think it, it, does, um, it does have a sense of frustration. I think we're making uh, really good uh, progress. I think where you hear from uh, those that are in receipt of self-directed support, there is a, an issue sometimes about where um, the amount of money they get has been reduced and some will see that as part of the, the, the austerity that local authorities face. But the other side of that coin is that self-directed support is working well and for the individual, they no longer, because their needs have changed, need the level of provision that they maybe once had with self-directed support. So I think we're, I think we're learning uh, a great deal as we progress and we need to, to use the next the coming months and years to uh, pick up on some of the issues that are emerging. Alison. Um, colleagues, including Marie Todd and Donald Cameron, have already brought up the issue of potential impact of Brexit on the workforce. And you know, while we're discussing this move of care in the community, I mean, the whole thing is predicated on us having enough social care staff. Um, I know the Scottish Social Services Coalition spoke about a survey of employees that was trying to understand better um, where people were coming from, but it seems we have a dearth of definitive data on the number of EU nationals working within NHS and social care. So I would just like to understand what steps the government are taking to establish this number, but also what contingencies are being put in place if EU nationals don't have an automatic right to remain after EU withdrawal? 
I think in terms of our medical and nursing workforce, it's a little easier because we have that, that data and the regulators have that data. So, you know, we're able to provide more definitive information, but, you know, as we have around the medical workforce, um, which, uh, um, you know, is a, is a concern um, in terms of the, the numbers. Um, as I think you heard earlier on, it's less clear with the social uh, care workforce because of the uh, the fact that the, the the processing of information, the gathering of information, is work in progress. Um, but I think what Sarah said earlier on, which she might want to expand upon, is that um, is looking at um, additional questions on the workforce survey to try and gather more information around um, whether someone is EU national or indeed out where where they, they come come from more generally would be helpful. Um, is, do you want to give a time frame for that? Um, the discussions with SSSC will be taking place over the next couple of months on whether we can change the data collection for the next round of data. Um, we are also considering whether we need to do something more urgently or in the shorter term because um, the SSSC collect data retrospectively, so there's a bit of a time lag between, or they publish the data retrospectively, so there's a bit of a time lag between um, the data being published, ready to publish, and the year it refers to. And so we're looking at whether we need to do an exercise very shortly, and then also change the, add, include a further question, um, so that going forward we collect the data that's needed to answer that question. Perhaps we could write to the committee to update you once that... We're clear about is, what we're going to do, yeah. yes, that would be fine. Yeah. Miles. Um, my question relates to care home places. Um, Audit Scotland have told the committee that um, Scotland will require an estimated 20,000 additional care home places by 2030. And a PQ, um, which I got back, has shown that Scotland's lost 3,600. Now, we're hearing from private sector providers that they're finding it difficult uh, to sustain the service. So what work's being undertaken to make sure that Scotland's adequately supplied with the care home places that we need? So our makeup of, um, of care home places and what we use care home places for has changed over the years. Um, and we've worked very closely with Scottish Care around that change. I mean, I, when I was a home care organiser in a previous life, um, it was not unusual for people to go into a care home setting actually when they were still quite fit and um, for a variety of reasons. Um, that, that it, was, it was a different... Uh, um, culture and uh, the, the ability perhaps of, of people to and wanting to remain at home um, perhaps people had have, have changed their outlook somewhat and the demand now without a doubt is for people to want to remain living in their own home with appropriate support so that has led to a change in the care home sector fewer places but also a bit of a change to what those places are used for so the discussions we've had with the care home sector is about uh, looking at um, uh, the needs and now going forward we're going to need more intermediate care so looking at what the sector can provide uh, for that and there are great examples and we've hugely expanded the number of of intermediate care places many of which are located within a care home environment that helps to put the care home sector onto a more sustainable footing and provide what is needed but also um, it provides a service which is a step down and potentially step up as well, although that's less developed, um, between home and hospital. So that's a really, really important uh, development. I think also it's fair to say that the complexity um, and needs of people who do end up in permanent care home places is far uh, greater than previously. So a lot of people with very complex needs with dementia, and that has meant that the, um, the, the number of places provided and that the care... Uh, staff ratio required for those uh, for, for the, complex, the complex needs of those people has changed as well. So I wouldn't necessarily see that the, these are negative developments. I think it's just a, a recognition of the changing needs of the population, what people demand and the need for the sector to adapt uh, to meet that. And we want to help them doing, in doing so. 
Glasgow and Clyde who are telling us that they're using the private care sector in Glasgow um, to help tackle delayed discharge. So there was a concern that potential loss of private sector beds there could then have an impact on the acute setting as well. So it's just uh, to be aware of unintended consequences of Scotland losing places. To have the right number of places to, in the right places to, to meet the needs of the population. But all I'm saying is that is changing. So the, the, the development in Glasgow, I visited the uh, one of the, the care homes that's providing that intermediate, that step down facility. And it is a fantastic service, um, something that is needed, that meets the needs of uh, the acute sector in, in helping to reduce uh, delayed discharge, um, but also provides um, some stability and, and sustainability for the care home sector. It is different from the role that the care home sector has traditionally uh, provided, but I think one that they've actually embraced very well indeed. Jeff, you were... Yeah, I, I, I think the, the Glasgow example is really interesting because it's an example of leverage um, in that through by working in that way, more people have returned home than would have historically been the case, which is what people say that they want to do. I think the Auditor General's report was also very careful and it said that if nothing changed and if things continued as they are, um, and as a report, I think it quite stunningly made the case for reform throughout the report in that there is a need mm -hmm. to, to think differently about how we approach care and how we pe meet people's needs. In, you know, in each of the partnerships that we're talking to at the moment, we're identifying that this idea of using more hours to uh, support reablement, mm -hmm. to support step down, and to increase people's capacity to continue mm -hmm. to care, care for themselves is, is core to the changes that we're seeing. So. And that point about reablement is really, really important as well. And back in my previous life as a home care organiser, quite often someone's needs will change because of a fall. They could out of hospital and the things they used to take for granted and did for decades themselves would suddenly be done by somebody else, even though with reablement they could get back those independent living skills. The thought processes around that have completely changed, and I think definitely for, for the better. I think, Sarah, you wanted to... Well, it was just to clarify the figures, I think, when talking about the care homes, and while the n total number of care homes has fallen quite a lot by 17% in the last 10 years since 2006, the number of registered places has only fallen by 3% and the number of um, residents only by 4%. And I suppose the figures which the Cabinet Secretary provided me in the written question suggested that there's 42,026 places now in Scotland, which was down 3,685. Um, so obviously, in terms of what Audit Scotland are saying, that extra 20,000, it was a concern that the direction of travel was down in terms of the number available. But it's what we use that's the, sec the places in the sector for. And, of course, we have seen a, a big increase in the um, number of care at home hours provided each week. Now, that, again, will be to, it's to fewer people because the level of complexity of people remaining in their home has increased, so their packages are greater. Therefore, the number of hours overall has increased. So I think what, what we're seeing is just a shift really in people remaining in their own home for longer, the the type of service then provided by the care home sector changing. Um, and we want to work very much with the sector in helping them to get on, you know, to provide a sustainably uh, a sustainable service that meets the needs of, of an aging population. I'd just like to ask one final question before we finish, because I think this is a really important one. Um, I think one of the most valuable and informative sessions we've had as a committee was meeting with social care workers a few weeks ago, both from uh, residential uh, care and from um, home care. How do we make a career in care more attractive, um, a more valued a career choice in, in the society that we're in? And I'm, I'm interested to hear your, your thoughts on that. That is a, the, probably the key key question and the most most important question. So I think partly the living wage is a is a component of that. That you know we have to make sure that we value uh, the, the the care uh, the caring role and the, the care the people working in the care sector, whether it's at home or in a care home. Um, the, um, and the living wage and what people are paid for that is an important component of that, as are some of the surrounding terms and conditions. And again, it's important that we work with the sector to try and improve 
that. But it's also about career opportunities and career progression. And we were seeing some really innovative ways of linking through the world of integration opportunities within health and care. So, for example, someone perhaps coming in to the, the care sector with an ambition to end up in a regulated profession and being able to do that in a more uh, coherent, structured uh, way that there's a pathway should they wish. Now, that won't be for everybody, but for many, I think that would be quite an attractive way of coming into a regulated profession, like nursing, for example. And we have some examples uh, across the country which we can furnish you with. I think Western Isles are, are doing that because they recognised they needed to de deliver, develop and deliver their own workforce. They couldn't wait for people to pitch up from elsewhere to meet the needs of, the, of their population. They were going to have to grow that. And part of the way they're doing that is to, is to, is to encourage people within their communities to think about health and care as a profession and pro to provide pathways through one into the other should that be what someone wants to do. And I think we, we need to get better at, at doing that. And when we're working with NES, um, to, to develop more coherent pathways through care and health and to share those training opportunities across the NHS that care staff can link into as well. Thank you. Can, I, can, um, can I pick up one? Yeah, very briefly. Very briefly. I just want to draw uh, members' attention to this, which is the, the social services vision and strategy for the next five years. And, and one of the four sections on it is in workforce, and it is about the valuing of the workforce you heard two, day, uh, two weeks ago. It's about how we actually recruit and retain much better, and there's a lot of work currently going on because we anticipated as a sector, and some of the people you saw uh, two weeks ago are part of that, about how we take things forward around the quality of social care in, in Scotland and the value placed on that workforce. Thank you, Mr Beard. I'd like to thank the panel and the Cabinet Secretary for their time this morning. Um, we'll now move into private session.